Hello everyone, my name is Miguel Myers. Welcome to My Horror Confessional, where every week I will have a guest come on and talk about one classic horror movie that they haven't seen and why. We'll discuss the movie, the actors, and probably get off topic quite a bit. Once I believe they have properly atoned, I will absolve them of their horror movie sin. Today we have Cass Clark. Cass Clark is a writer, podcaster, critic, and martial artist. They're a Rotten Tomatoes approved critic and proud member of Gallica, the Society of LGBTQ Entertainment Critics. They have an MFA in creative writing from Emerson College and enjoy spending their spare time talking about stories and playing in a spooky cover band, Lady in the Radiator. Currently, they're features editor and writer for Slash Film and teach Taekwondo to children in their spare time. Their favorite genre is horror. They are also the co-host of Horror Hangover, which I have been a guest on, and I had a blast. So Cass, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Miguel. I'm so excited to dive into this movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that you chose. We had an, a, a movie picked out, but then we changed it for the bad scene, which I am so excited because I, I love old horror movies. I'm an old head. I just turned 40 uh, last weekend, and I'm like, I, I love 70s. I love 60s. I love, love 50s. I'm just recently... Like I've I've seen the big ones that have come out and all that, but like I, I I needed to make a point to really focus on current movies, so that's what I'm doing now. But my love is for all things old, and so when you said uh, the bad seed, I was so excited. So I um, uh, can't wait to jump into that. But first, uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit about so this bio is amazing. So <laughs> can we talk about Taekwondo and the martial arts? Oh, totally. Uh, what do you want to know? <laughs> so is that something that you picked up as an adult or have you uh, done That's martial arts as a kid? Yeah, I started when I was four because one day um, I like heard my dad in my basement and I went downstairs uh, and he was just like punching the bag. And I was like, I want to do that. And my dad was always very, very into like, you know, listen to kids, you know, uh, if they ask for something like, why not? So like the next day he started researching like local karate places. So uh, I got really into that and I did karate from about four to around like 15 ish. Cause then at that point it was like, I want to go out with friends and I want to like yeah, <laughs> play yeah. the movies. And so I stopped off for a bit. And then right around the time that I finished my undergrad, so probably like 2000, ooh, I'm bad with math. Let's just say blank time <laughs> sometime. Um, I got back into martial arts and I picked up uh, Taekwondo. Uh, at JH Kim Taekwondo Studio in Porter Square, which I love. And I've been doing it for a, about 10 years now. So uh, yeah, so it's been like at least two decades of my life with martial arts. Wow. And is martial arts something that you can pick up like riding a bike or to do where you're starting from scratch? It's so funny because in some ways, yes. And in some ways, no, because bodies change. Like what you can do at a certain age, not to say you can't do it at an older age, but um, like... When I was four, I remember I could just jump into a split, like, <laughs> just like, woohoo. Uh, I am now in my, like, mid-30s, so, like, I need a lot of stretching to do it, and it <laughs> takes longer to get back into that, but yeah. I can do it. So it's, like, uh, a little bit like riding a bike, but sometimes you need training wheels for certain things. <laughs> nice. Okay. And so um, in, does does that inform, does martial arts inform the type of media that you, you consume? Like, did you also grow up? Did you also grow up being like a lover of like 80s martial arts movies or 90s stuff, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think I was really big into like more of like TV stuff. Like I used to love, I feel like it might be cringe to rewatch it now, but I remember watching that that Kung Fu show with like David uh, Carradine. Carradine, yeah. Yeah, I used to love that. Um, I really loved uh, Power Rangers as a kid. Um, I, I don't think until I was a bit older did I get really into like, when I was like in my like, 20s i was like super into like jet lee and like donnie yen and bruce lee and it's like now i really do like watching martial arts movies but i'm very picky um like i don't really like american action movies a lot of the time because i'm just like i can't see what's happening where did that punch go why are we cutting away what is going on okay so i recently within the last couple days saw this movie called writing wrongs from 1986 and it was starring Cynthia Rothrock, who is basically, you can tell by the name, is an American who who knew, um, shit, I don't know if it was Kung Fu, but knew martial arts well enough that, like, she was in, um, she was in competitions, mm -hmm. and, um, like, they, 
um, Hong Kong came calling from from there because they saw her in the competition, so they put her in all these movies. Yeah. And so she blew up in China, but never could really make the the um, jump over to to America. But she was she's badass. If you haven't seen anything by her, I, I recommend it. The one, I mean, I've only seen one, so I can't claim to be a an expert or anything like that. But um, it was called Writing Wrongs from 1986. Cool. Um, and it's it's known by a bunch of other names like above the law or something like that. But the uh, I won't tell you more. And I, it, it's got a really cool uh-huh. vibe to it. So uh, I would you one recommendation too because I definitely want to check that out because I just googled her and it, she apparently has seven black belts or maybe eight. It looks like so like yeah, yeah I'm in <laughs> yeah. And like she there was an interview with her. It was it was for like an no, it was for Synapse. What the um. It's like it's like Arrow, but it's um, oh Severin films. Severin films, yeah, yeah, yeah Severin films. Uh, it was for Severin films, and um, they had a brand new interview with her, and she looked so young, like still, and she was still in great shape, and she's like talking about still being in movies until to now, you know, thirty four or forty, almost forty years later. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to be looking into her Ovar because she was pretty badass. Yeah, and if you do, um, yes, madam. If you haven't seen that, that's with Michelle Yeoh. I have seen that one. Yes, that's the one. Uh, my friend Stanley, who had seen, yes, madam, as well. That's why he brought this one over. Um, so that I do, I haven't seen it, but I do know that, that that's going to be my next one. So you've seen her in something at least. Yeah, yeah, because I realized because I really like Michelle Yeoh, so I was like, oh, I have seen yes, madam. That's a really good one. Okay, cool. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely gonna check that out. All right, let's get back. Let's get to horror. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You came over here with your martial arts agenda. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about horror. <laughs> So, um, I, first of all, I have to go back and ask the cover band. It's, I don't even know where to go with his bio here. So, the cover band. Cover band is called Lady and the Radiator. Yeah, I did not make up that name. That was my friend <laughs> CJ. <laughs> okay. Um, what's, yeah. it, what's it in reference to? I believe it's a David Lynch reference that I don't know. So, I'm not a very big Lynchian person. Love him, yeah. but it's not my thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching um, Twin Peaks right now. Oh, the original or the, um, the, like- the original? I had never my wife. Well, my wife's seen it, but I hadn't seen it, and we're in season two, like a couple episodes in. Okay. I'm not 100 percent on board, but there's a reason why I w- I kind of stayed away for a while because I know everybody loves it, and I didn't. I, I had that inkling like I wasn't going to, and I'm. It's good. I, I'm uh, I'm gonna wait until I, I finish it to to kind of judge it. But yeah. uh, okay, what what kind of who are you a cover band for? Uh, it's a lot of just like spooky Halloween music. So a lot of misfits, a lot of um, dancing, Bauhaus, that kind of vibe. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's <laughs> awesome. And so what what uh, what instrument do you play? Are you vocals or? Uh, I'm rhythm guitar. Okay. So you're a guitar playing martial arts, horror loving badass is what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you might know. be the coolest person I've ever had on this podcast. That's I just, awesome. This is great because I'm very, uh, I would I would say, I can say humble, but really I'm just very like nerdy and neurotic. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, well, first of all, I can, I can completely understand that I have the <laughs> imposter syndrome all, all the time. So, um, so, but let's talk a little bit about your history with horror. So did you grow up loving horror or did you come into that at a later age as well? Or sorry, did you come into that at a later age? Yeah, it's so funny because I was listening to actually your episode with Ryan uh, a couple or so weeks ago. Uh, and it was always really funny because Ryan's like, oh, uh, Cass is like a lifelong horror fan. I'm like, am I? And it got me thinking about it. I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, I think I was always fascinated by horror. I think the two big moments that stood out for me was when I was little and I watched Jaws much too young. I was terrified of sharks. I think I watched it around like eight years old. Thanks to my dad. Um, But like I got obsessed with that feeling of being scared and like devoured reading all kind of like little like those scholastic books about sharks, like 10 facts about great white sharks or stuff. And I love that feeling. Um, And then I don't really remember watching too many scary movies until about like 15 or so whenever. Yeah, that tracks because right around when Scream uh, 2 was released on DVD. And I remember watching Scream 1 and Scream 2 at a friend's house. And when you watch the DVD version of Scream, there's a special edition thing where they like tell you every single like reference or homage of scary movies in it. And so for a summer, me and my friend tried to watch like every film that was in there. So like, that's how I saw Prom Night. So I was like, oh, they, it's on the Scream list. We have to watch it. <laughs> and I think from there, it's when it kind of started. That is such a great idea. I love that idea. 
Yeah. That's an amazing way to get to get into the genre. Yeah, especially because like I feel like everyone of my generation usually is like Scream is their go-to of like, oh yes, that was my Gateway Horror movie. Um, but what I really do love about that movie is because, especially because they included that, it makes it easier for you to go back and see what inspired it. So I love that. I think that was yeah. Awesome. So is, is it safe to say that Scream is your favorite movie or, or one of your favorite movies? Or? Yeah, probably one of. I think what, which horror movie like the most like changes on the day, you know. Uh-huh. I, I'm always like, because the, my favorite movie of all time and my favorite horror movie has always been Halloween since I was like mm-hmm. three mm-hmm. and it hasn't changed. And I, I'm jealous because I feel like I'm in like um, – I haven't really, I've seen thousands of movies since then. And I'm like, yes. really? There's not one movie that's better than Halloween. And <laughs> yes. it's like, I feel like maybe I'm gaslighting myself a little bit, I but know. I just say like, emotionally, I'm not ready to change that, mm-hmm. you know? But mm-hmm. so, so when other people say like their favorite movie is anything but Halloween, I'm like, really fascinating. Tell me more. Yeah. And it's hard too, because I feel like once a movie's like your favorite, like I can't even tell if Scream is good anymore because I've seen it so many times and there's that nostalgia value. So it's like, I don't know. I don't even think I can think critically about it because I like it so much. Exactly. That's like, I'm, I I can't watch it with people who haven't seen it. Like if it's their first time, unless like, I know you're, you're cool and you're chill. Like, yeah. And you're going to like it. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to have a fun time with it. But like, I have a friend, Zach, who's been on the podcast before. He's a complete troll. He's the definition <laughs> of a troll. And he's like, yeah, I want to watch Halloween with you. I've, ne- I've never seen it. I'm like, no, you're going to, I can't. It's too precious. I don't hold things a lot of things. I don't hold a lot of things precious, but like, that's precious to me. So I'm like, I'm not fucking watching with you. He ended up watching it like a couple years later, like during the day on his phone, like, and he oh, had just no. texted me like, oh, this sucks. I'm like, eh, whatever. I don't care. I don't care. He's trying to trigger me is what it is. <laughs> So I'm getting worked up here just talking about that. So I'm going to, we're going to move on here. So, um, so you actually write for a bunch of horror publications, horror websites and such. Mm -hmm. So you were able to successfully like transition something you loved into something that you make a career out of. Yeah. Would you, would you be able to, to tell me how, how that came about? Uh, I mean, really just, (laughs) Thanks to the pandemic, if I'm being honest, like I've always uh, written here or there and pitched here or there as I was always like working multiple jobs or like a day job I hated. Um, And then I got laid off in the pandemic and a friend of mine was an editor at CBR at the time and I went to school with her. So she knew my writing and she's like, look, we need writers. Just start writing. I was like, oh, but freelancing, Jesus, I don't know. And then I just kind of like jumped in. and I discovered I really loved interviews and that's where like my passion is. And then it just kind of went from there. Like I just really dived into that. And then thanks to that job, I ended up like making connections with other people at different sites and then just got more like courage to pitch elsewhere. Um, and yeah, just kept doing the work really. So now it's like three years in uh, and I kind of have to pinch myself. Like the other day I was talking, I don't know if you like uh, Dragula or anything, but I love the Boulay Brothers Dragula. Mm-hmm. And the other day, I was like talking to Dolly, who won like last season. I was like, "What the fuck is my life? <laughs> like, what did this happen?" That's um, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's some days are hard. Freelancing is hard. I don't want to romanticize it too much because I feel like there's a danger in that. But it is. I do love what I do. Yeah, and that's important. Yeah. Of the work that you have done, is there one particular piece that you're most proud of? That's a great question. Um, hmm. I think the one um, that is at the top of my head is probably, uh, honestly, one of my most recent bylines at Denim Geek um, because my uh, my father recently passed away last month and we had to call hospice. And it was this weird like kismet of events where like the Midnight Club came out at the same time. And it's really rare that like, something in your life is happening and then it's actually being depicted on screen like simultaneously. It's one thing if you like, you know, something in your life is happening and like, oh, I'm going to go seek out this hard property to feel better. You know, like I know it covers this. I'm going to watch it. Maybe it'll make me feel worse. Maybe it will help me. Um, but it, yeah, it just happened to come out at the same time. So I wrote a piece for Den of Geek just about how I thought they handled like grief and dying like in a really lovely way. And, and I feel like that show compared to all of other Mike Flanagan stuff, just went super under the radar and people just weren't feeling it and it just mystified me. So I feel like that piece recently like 
hit home because it was like a personal topic, but also something that I was just like, yeah, people don't talk about hospice. We don't really see grief on screen. Like it's rad that Flanagan's trying to do something with that. So that one is the most one that comes to mind, I guess. Okay. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Uh, as a person who had a family member go through hospice, I completely understand how difficult that is. Yeah. Uh, and I actually read your piece and I, and I found it very moving. So it was, you did a great job on that. So your love of horror kind of started um, in as a teenager and, and then kind of carried forward. And did you have a circle of friends who enjoyed horror with you or was it a, more of a solitary endeavor? Um, I think off and on. I think it's like I always like scary movies, but I think. Well, there is Kelly Del Santo, who is the person I watched Scream with when I was 15, and we watched those movies together. And then Kevin McSherry uh, in my freshman year of college. Super. He was, I think he probably gets a lot of cred. We I don't talk anymore. It was one of those friendships that just like change as you get older. But um, he was the one that was like the real horror nerd. Like he was the one that's just like, we're going to watch Wreck. We're going to watch uh high tension and i'm like what we're gonna watch friday the 13th and i'm like okay <laughs> like he's he gets all like, great movies all fantastic fantastic tastes really yeah um but i feel like he really showed me like because i'd seen all like the big blockbuster ones but i didn't really know much about like indie horror so i feel like that person just like jump started it and after that not really until like ryan c bradley in uh when we met at emerson and the now, like now it's a bit different because now I have friends like you and other podcasting, like horror nerds I get to talk to, uh, which is lovely. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. And so um, in your horror path or your horror journey, was it a lot of like newer movies or, or of the time, like 90s, Scream was in 90s and then going forward? Did you did you look back a lot to like the movies that came before that or was it kind of like in, in the decade that you were in sort of thing? Yeah, I think it was like, I think it started off more or less like what was coming out now. And then also that was, I mean, back in the day of cable, you know, like what would be on, you know, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. before streaming. But I think like the older I get, the more I'm fascinated by like, is this actually like an original idea or is there something that this is like calling back to? Like, I know we'll get to in a second, but like the joy I felt watching, um, the bad seed because I was like, I'm someone that loves the orphan movies. I friggin' love them. And I'm like, Oh, now this makes me love like how orphan is very much like <laughs> looking after the bad seed and the, like in the outfits and all these details. So, like now I like to look back more. Um, Cause I love the idea when films like speak to each other. I think that's really cool. So now I'm trying to get better at looking like in the seventies, particularly is like a weak spot. Um, I feel like I've seen the class, a lot of the class, like older classics, like the black and white movies, but not so much in like 60s, 70s is like my weak point. But tons of 80s, tons of 90s. <laughs> okay. This is going to be great. I'm going to have, I have, I'm going to have a lot of fun like recommending you oh, yeah, some movies uh, later on. So it's going to be fun. Um, so let's go ahead and get started because you chose, um, well, actually, you're on to confess your sin that you've never seen The Bad Seed from 1956. Is that correct? That is correct. And why do you think this particular movie passed you by? Is it just like you said, um, you know, you just hadn't had a chance to get to it? What has it? Was it on your list and you never got to it, or had you never even heard of it? It was on my list. Uh, I think it's because when I heard it mentioned to me, it was like on a podcast I really like, and they were in love with it, and I was like, oh, I really like this podcast. What if I watch it and I don't like it? And then I feel like I have bad taste. <laughs> like I sometimes get this. Um, yeah. When someone really hypes up a movie, like, oh, this is a classic. This is genre defining. Sometimes that puts me off a little bit for watching it, even though I know I might likely enjoy it. Because um, I'm like, well, what if I don't? And then I feel bad. <laughs> it, it temper, it changes your opinion uh, yeah. about somebody. Mm -hmm. If like they really love a movie and you're like, ah, that's okay. I completely understand that, right? And it might even only be temporary. Like you're not, you're not maybe going to hold it against them. Or I would, if it's a close friend, I would yeah. hold them against them for the rest of their life. And be like, oh, but you like such and such. You, yeah. you, you, your opinion is trash. That's basically my conversation with my friend Zach all the time. It's like, don't recommend anything to me because your opinion is trash. Uh, so the bad seed from 1956, uh, directed by Mervyn Leroy or Leroy. I, I don't know how to pronounce this, and I also don't know how to pronounce the character's name in this movie. That's Leroy because different people pronounce it differently in the movie. But I'm just gonna say uh, 
Leroy. So uh, Mervyn Leroy, who um, I was surprised to find that he had also directed The Wizard of Oz um, mm-hmm. and Little Caesar, which is the, like one of the original like gangster flicks that came out in 1931. Mm-hmm. And I am a fugitive from a chain gang, which I absolutely love. I, I got it maybe 10, 15 years ago. I really got into gangster movies from the thirties and forties, oh. like the black and white stuff. And so I didn't realize he, he directed a ton of those. So that was really, really cool to see. Yeah. And the writers were um, John Lee Mahin. He did the screenplay. He also did the screenplay for The Wizard of Oz oh, cool. and the original Scarface from 1932, not not the one that came out in the 70s or, or 80s, I should say. Uh, and he did the original A Star is Born oh, in 1937. Cool. So you could tell like the pedigree of this movie is amazing. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, it Also a co-writer, um, or the writer of the play was Maxwell Anderson and he wrote Vertigo. He was uncredited on it. And he was uncredited on Ben Hur as well, so like just, just amazing like uh, directors and writers. And then obviously this was from a novel um, by the same name, written by William March. So I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the cast before we get into it. Um, uh, I was surprised because I had seen this movie before, maybe a decade ago, and I was surprised to see that this was a predominantly um, female-driven cast, which mm. was awesome to see in the fifties. You know. Yeah. What, what did you feel about, how did you feel about that when you, you kind of saw all our, our big players for the movie? It's so funny because like, I don't think I consciously acknowledge that, but thinking about it now, it is kind of delightful that like all the men are just sideline players. Like it's totally about the women in this film and the way that women are really reaching out to each other to just like, <laughs> to be real with one another. Everyone is asking that, like, just be honest with me, be honest with me. Like, no one else is around. You can be honest with me. Uh, and they're still afraid to. And you're like, oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I found it refreshing. You know, it wasn't uh, even the the one character, um, the mother of the, the child who passes away, like. Ooh, Hortense. She, Hortense, <laughs> yes. She, she comes in and like steals the show in every scene she's in. I know. But like she is a grieving mother who has this like ferocious anger underneath it but even then she's still trying to be polite and still trying to be you know and whereas like i feel like if this was a male driven cast if if that character was male he would have just come in swinging and punching and like with a gun you know what i'm saying so it was just really really um refreshing to see so all right let's let me finish up this cast so we can get started i'm i'm jumping the gun here so um christine penmark was played by nancy kelly who was known for Jesse James, from, uh, which came in 1939. She was a former child actress, mm. which was cool to see because we've I've talked in the past on the show about what happens to child actresses mm. or just actors in general, child actors in general. Mm. Um, she won the 1955 Tony Award for Actress in a Drama for The Bad Seed, and she recreated her role for this movie. So you could tell like she brought all that experience with it, and this felt like a lived-in character. Mm. The, the same with... Um, Rhoda, played by Patty McCormick, who also w- played the her her uh, character in the in the play. She also earned an Oscar nomination for the film, but she never made another theatrical movie after this. She was only focusing on TV and stuff like that. So then we have um, the character Monica, played by Evelyn Varden. She was actually in Night of the Hunter and Cheaper by the Dozen. Have you seen Night of the Hunter? From no. 1955. Okay, that's going to be well, that's the, like uh, <laughs> exactly uh, automatic. You're making the job easy. That's going to be the, <laughs> the suggestion. Uh, and then there's um, Leroy, played by Henry Jones. He was in Vertigo and Butch uh, Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And then we had Eileen Heckert, who is Mrs. Hortense Daigle, and she was uh, nominated for an Oscar and Golden Globe for this role. Mm-hmm. And she didn't win, but she ended up winning for Butterflies Are Free in 1972. And um, yeah, she got the best supporting actress in that role. Nice. So, so yeah. So I think just a stellar cast all around. So this, the movie starts very quickly. It's a dark and stormy night, and we get the title. Ca- the, we get the title card immediately. There's no time to fuck about. Um, these credits were at the beginning, like the older films used to have, mm-hmm. and this always throws me off because whenever I watch a newer movie and check how much time is left, like. I, 
uh, I always subtract five minutes f- for the credits or like 10 minutes, 10 uh-huh. minutes if it's a Marvel movie. Yeah. <laughs> and I got that from my wife because my wife does that all, all the time. And we now we do it obsessively. We're just like time check, time check. And it has nothing to do with like if the movie's interesting or not. Sometimes if the movie's really, really fascinating, we're like, fuck, how much time is left? We need to know if, you know, if there's like 10 minutes and the movie's going to end really quickly, if we still have like a long time in it. Is that is that something you can do? Do you ever check time? I do, yeah. Especially when I'm like especially with this one, which I know we'll get into because I felt like there were like three, I feel like it could have ended three different times and yes, I would have been yeah. totally satisfied with each one. But then I was like, oh, wait, there's more. And I'm like, wait, how much more? And I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? So yeah, I totally do that. Especially when I'm liking a movie. because I'm like, Oh God, don't drop the ball. We're so close. It was definitely like Lord of the Rings, return of the, return of the <laughs> thing. Like, like, yeah. like, okay, we're ending now. No. Okay. We're ending now. Oh, okay. So, um, we see a shot of a pier with a boathouse at the end of it. Then the camera pans to the left and we see a town off in the distance. The scene fades as we hear more thunder crashing and it's a very ominous start indeed. Next, we see a car pulling up to a typical 1950s home in a typical 1950s suburb. The man driving the car honks the horn as he pulls up as he exits the car and starts to approach the house. We hear the sounds of, I can say this, Al Claire de la Luna. I think it was what it's called coming from within the home. Then a man leans out of a window and says he'll be out in a minute. And this is Colonel Kenneth Penmark. He readies his things and informs his wife and child that he'll be leaving. And he walks in on Rhoda, his eight-year-old daughter, playing the piano. She's dressed in a high-waisted, like, flouncy red and white. I didn't know how to describe it, but then Monica later on describes it, so I'm just going to pull what she said. It's a red and white Swiss dress. And she's got blonde hair, and it's pulled tight back into pigtails and she is supposed to like what did you get from this just from this first image of that we see of of rhoda uh it's it's like so chilling i mean i said it before but it made me definitely think of uh esther and orphan but no i mm-hmm. like the idea of uh how she feels like this porcelain doll like she feels too pristine and mm-hmm. it's on un- it's uncomfortable like her hair is braided like so tightly wound everything is like perfect even the characters remark about how clean she is and i'm like oh that's not right you're an eight-year-old why aren't you like covered in dirt (laughs) yeah it's psychopathic behavior feels like it's like you're hiding something you your beautiful external needs to hide like how ugly you are inside yes and i think that's what's going on with her but but to everybody who like barely knows her and even her dad like is like oh she's a perfect daughter right because a father like in that age didn't really spend a lot of time with their kids, especially mm-hmm. like a military man is going to be away. And so I, I doubt he spent a lot of time with her. Whereas the mother, like she's always had this inkling that something's wrong with her child because she knows her best, you know? Yeah. It's already like Shirley Temple-esque, right? It was just like, you're all you have to do is look the right way. I don't care what's going on in that little brain of yours. Just look presentable. <laughs> and it's funny. It's reminded me of baby Jane from whatever happened to baby Jane. Oh, um, oh yeah. Have you seen, have you ever seen that I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> Again. <laughs> all right. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah. That's going to be another recommendation, but yeah, it's kind of a similar thing where we have a, in that movie, she was a child star and she was supposed to be, she was like perfect and all that, but it really, she was like a monster behind the scenes. Mm. And so we don't get like, we don't see the monster behind the scenes here, but it's kind of, you know, really similar. So yeah. anyway, he asks her to come say bye to him. Uh, as they're talking, she asks if her father will write to them every day and put in a, sp- a special page just for her. And so we immediately get the impression that she's a daddy's girl. Mm-hmm. Right? The doorbell rings and we meet the landlady slash neighbor slash local busybody, Monica. <laughs> Which I really like Monica because she knows what she what she is. like. She's a busy, busybody mm-hmm. and she gets into people's business, but she also knows how to stop herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, like it doesn't doesn't go as far even in the end she says oh i bully you so and i'm gonna i'm not gonna do it you know but I, normally this character i'd be like oh god go find some business but like i, I actually <laughs> liked monica you know yeah same same um so i just said here like get used to the name monica because you're going to be hearing it a lot <laughs> because christine just calls everybody by their first name all the time mm-hmm. like monica rhoda like all the time 
So Monica walks in on the scene and she starts talking a mile a minute. And we find out that both herself and her brother are childless and that he never gets a word in edgewise, edgewise around her. Most of this is said with a candy in her mouth, which she has taken from a dish left on a table. Weird to understand that this that she feels very comfortable in this house mm-hmm. because she just walks in and announces and she grabs whatever she wants. It felt very um, Kramer, Kramer-esque yeah. from, from Seinfeld. You know? Yeah, it's a great comparison. Yeah. So Monica says hi and bye to the colonel and tells Rhoda, again, get used to that name, that she has a present for her. The colonel says bye to his little girl and asks her, what will you do if I give you a basket full of kisses? To which she responds, I'll give you a basket of hugs. Like we hear this a bunch of times. throughout the <laughs> Yes, it's very creepy. And then he lifts her up and kisses her goodbye. This is all very like 1950s TV show quaint. Yeah, you know, and it also feels very. Um, who's the guy who who did um, Twin Peaks? Oh, David Lynch. Yeah, it feels I, like I can understand where Lynch is pulling his his yeah. uh, stuff from because this is what it feels like. Um, like he did that in Blue Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Christine walks her husband out to the car and says goodbye. She asks him to ask her father to come visit her when he sees him for dinner, uh, and it seems he's. He's off to D.C. on assignment and may be gone for an extended period of time. They kiss passionately in that black and white way of just like mushing your lips together. Yeah. And then he's off. Like kisses in the black and white era was so weird. It's, it, it was off-putting. It's always just like literally like they were rubbing their lips against each other like windshield wipers. Just like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so weird. Back inside. Monica has gifted Rhoda a set of rhinestone encrusted dark glasses. She called them dark glasses, but they're sunglasses. Mm. Uh, Christine seems a bit perturbed about the gift and asks Monica if she hasn't heard of spoiling a child. Monica says, I'll see your spoiled comment and adds another gift, a gold (laughs) necklace with a garnet pendant, which a garnet is, I didn't know what it was. I had to look it up. It's a rock. It's a type Mm. of. Mm -hmm. But she says they'll have to switch that out for Rhoda's birthstone, which is turquoise. Rhoda then asks, to Christine's horror, if she can have both of them. Uh, This is the first indication we're given that something is off with this little girl. She isn't, quote unquote, polite. Mm -hmm. But Monica is amused by this and uh, and, um, agrees immediately to give her both. And she says, how wonderful to meet a natural little girl. She knows what she wants and she asks for it. This is the first of Monica and other adults excusing her behavior. Mm -hmm. And she says it's not like uh, it's not like the over civilized little pets to have to go through analysis before they can choose an ice cream soda. <laughs> oh, Monica, Monica and her Freud. She just yeah. loves to go in. <laughs> and and I'm not a child psychiatrist, so I don't know. You know, I know that society tries to get women or little girls to behave from a very young age, and so like she has to be polite and not ask for what she wants, but. She's doing so like, and so I don't know if this, the movie here is saying that she's bad for asking for this, or if this is just an indicator of badness or because I don't see, maybe there's a better way that she could have gone about it, but like, I don't see anything wrong with a little girl asking for what she wants. Yeah. I think it's like, I thought about that a lot too. Cause like what the movie is intentionally saying that we take away from, it, I feel like it's, it's always going to be two different things, but I feel like if anything, it's kind of the first scene where I got the feeling that, which we'll get into the whole nature versus nurture versus environment. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, I think this is one of the first times we see of an adult setting up Rhoda to kind of fail, you know, like no matter who she Mm -hmm. is, like Monica doesn't even ask her mother if it's okay. And and to like to, and honestly just overrides her mother and gives her a gift anyway. Um, even if that's going to make her think that all she has to do is ask for something and then get it. It's like conditioning her that like, that's how the world works. You ask for something and you get it. There's not really a no, there's not a not now. So I feel like it's more of like a critique on the parenting styles and the adults that are influencing her. Um, I don't know. It's fascinating. I don't know, man. (laughs) Yeah, I I think you're right. And it it does get to that nature versus nurture thing. If, if the parents were i'm not trying to blame parents again i'm not a i'm not a psychiatrist i'm just talking about a movie so i I don't know don't don't quote me on any of this shit but like in this particular instance if the mother had perhaps not let not given the daughter everything she wanted would she have been different or would that 
bad seedness of it all just have have overridden anyway. You know, I think it's yeah. really interesting what they're doing. So then Rhoda hugs her Aunt Monica and th- uh, thanking her for the present. And Monica asks why she's wearing the dress and not jeans, like uh, like most little kids, to go to the picnic. And Christine says that Rhoda never gets anything dirty, and she has no idea how she does it. Um, but but basically Rhoda's like, oh, it's not, you know, blue jeans aren't. And then like Monica finishes her thought and says that blue jeans aren't ladylike. It's like, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> this is definitely 1956. Yeah. Rhoda asks Monica if she's to keep the locket and the glasses. Monica says yes until she can find a jeweler to replace the garnet with a turquoise. Then Christine reminds Rhoda that they'll be leaving soon and asks if her room is tidy. And Rhoda, I don't know if you notice this, but Rhoda gives her this quick up and down glance. Like, <laughs> bitch, please, you know the fucking answer to this. And like, she answers her own question. She's like, yes, of course. Like, uh, there was no reason to to ask that question. You know. Mm-hmm. Next, in walks Leroy without knocking. Again, like these people just don't know just and don't have any boundaries, you know, no personal bubbles. Like, especially like you have a, a, a woman in, in the house or even a little kid. You can't just be walking in. And especially when the father is gone. Now, you know, I, like that sounds very 1950s to me. When but, they're by themselves. Yeah, but in the context of the time, it's yes. weird. It's very weird. <laughs> yeah. Please, please. <laughs> don't, don't cancel me. <laughs> All right. So um, so he just walks in and unannounced. No, I mean, he walks in and, and announces himself. And Monica admonishes him, telling him to ring first, and if nobody answers, then use his key. He listens only half-heartedly, and then he walks away, not ready to deal with her bullshit this morning. <laughs> so, but I did want to mention one thing that we all love Monica, or at least I do. I don't know how you feel, but she is a landlord, right? Mm-hmm. And we're all in the eat the rich era. So mm-hmm. she might be the true villain here. We don't know. Let's let's figure out a way that she's the actual villain. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so he walks off and stops at the kitchen to gawk at Christine. He says, good morning. And uh, so does she, but then she closes the kitchen door right in his face. Um, I, I get like, because I had seen this movie so long ago, it was kind of, it was a new movie to me. So I was like, oh man, I hope he doesn't do anything. Like, I hope he's not a creep and it doesn't become that type of movie, you know, which luckily didn't happen. Even with his interactions with, um, with, R- with Rhoda, um, at first, I was like, oh, man, like, why is this grown ass man talking to this girl like this? But yeah. you you very quickly and we're about to learn here that he has the they say that he has the mind of an eight year old. Right? Mm-hmm. Who yeah, knows if they're talking shit about him or or if that's actually the case. Yeah. And I think there's like a again, 50s, again, Hayes Code error. I I believe he's like leering enough that he's like coded as like pedophile e. Okay. Like, I think that like I kind of read it as like if he knew he could get away with it with Rhoda, and if Rhoda wasn't like a murdering psychopath, I think he probably would have tried something, you know. But like Rhoda's not here to fuck around, so he like didn't even try. And I think that is maybe maybe half the reason why like besides like literally being their gardener and watching these rich people have like fake tea parties <laughs> while he's like sleeping in a cot in the basement. Like there's a lot of layers of why he's aggressive t- towards Rhoda, but maybe one of them is like pent up tension of like obsessively luring, but knowing like this is someone he can't have. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that. I, th- I don't think there's too, too much. I think it's just like suggestive, but mm-hmm. I like that reading too. Cause then you feel less bad when what happens to Leroy happens. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, and there's actually another character later on in the movie that does something, touches her, what what I feel like is inappropriate. And um, I'm like, why, why? And you just get like this sinking feeling in your stomach. Like, why are you doing that? And we'll get to that if you hadn't noticed it. So, um, so, but apparently Leroy does the chores around the building for the tenants. And so he's in and out of the apartments. And we find out here that Leroy has the mind of an eight-year-old, but he has a family. So she keeps him on. We then see Leroy walks up to Rhoda's room and antagonizes her, like right off rip. He just talks, starts talking shit to her as like saying that they didn't have picnics when he was in school. And she puts away her necklace and walks past Leroy and says, I don't care what you didn't have and dismisses him with a wave of her hand, which I fucking love. I love it so much, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, I know she's a killer, but the bad bitch energy is so good. <laughs> like to be destroyed by an eight-year-old, like how, where do you go from there? You know? I don't 
So as Rhoda waits for her mom to be ready to leave for the picnic, she does a little tap dance with her shoes on the wood floor. As she's doing so, Leroy bumps into her accidentally, quote unquote, as he leaves the apartment. He's got this big smug smile on his face, and Rhoda knows that it wasn't an accident. So we find out that Christine had iron bits added to Rhoda's shoes because she's a bit rough on them and she wanted them to last longer. But then Christine says it was all Rhoda's idea. So from what we learn later on, my question to you is, was this all premeditated? I mean, it's Rhoda, so <laughs> I would say yes. Yeah, like did she know, like had it been a while since she lost the, well, we're, we're about to find out now, or that she lost uh, the contest for best penmanship. Yeah. And so she was like, ah, there's got to be some way. I don't know, but I just, there's little bits of pieces here. I'm like, man, was this. Did she plan this all along or was or was it kind of heat of the moment thing? I don't think, well, she does do, no, she doesn't do heat of the moment things because even, even later on, it was premeditated, right? I think like, I think at this point in the film, I, I think up until like maybe the middle half, you'd be like, okay, this is just like the, just the situation happened and she had a fit of fury and lost lost her mind. But uh, no, I think it was, I think the more and more thing about it, it had to be premeditated, especially because like when we get to it, at the end of the film with the lovebirds conversation where she's plotting out like this murder yes, and yes. kind of asking the question, like, okay, how long do I have? Mm-hmm. How long can I keep this person or like alive? And when does it interfere with what I want? So like I, 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 she had to have, I think. Right. Yeah. Which makes this even better. <laughs> so Monica states she wanted to give Rhoda, pre- Rhoda her presence today because she didn't win the penmanship award at school. When she mentions this, Rhoda's eyes enlarge and she goes off. It's the only, she says, it's the only medal Miss Fern gives and it was really mine. I just don't see how Claude Deagle got the medal. And then Christine reminds Rhoda that they've discussed this. And she says, we must simply accept these things. She goes to hug her, but Rhoda leans away and Christine apologizes, saying, I know you don't like people pawing on you, which I believe is important to remember because later on when uh, when she's accused of things, her her first instinct is to go and hug somebody, mm-hmm. to use her cuteness to, to her benefit, you know? So I saw this movie twice, once just all, just the way through, not taking any notes, just to enjoy it, and then the second to take notes. And I know I say this a lot about a lot of movies, but this movie does benefit a second viewing. It gives you more more information and it makes it, it just makes it better, I think. Mm-hmm. So Rhoda runs out of the room screaming, it was mine, it was mine. And she walks out of the house and Leroy is there watering the plants and he accidentally, on purpose, splashes water on Rhoda's shoes. And then she gets yelled at by Monica for doing that. And then he does it again by accident on purpose. So Monica has had it with his shit and is ready to fire him. But Christine stops her. She reads him for filth, but ultimately does not fire him. Uh, Rhoda says this was no accident and she knows him. Their hate, hate relationship is great. I am very much fuck them kids in movies. Like, uh, when there's a child actor, a lot of the times I'm like, ah, this is going to suck. This child, this child actor was great. Yeah. But, um, for example, the one I bring up all the time is child's play. And that, that, that child actor, Andy made that movie almost unwatchable for me. And so when I see an adult talking shit to a kid, I'm like, hell yeah, fuck them kids. man. <laughs> so I love that hate, hate relationship they got going on. But, but I love how they both give it to each other. Like she doesn't back down at all, you mm-hmm. know? So Rhoda yells at him and this surprises Christine and Leroy apologizes and wipes at her feet and Monica uh, shoes Leroy away and says it's too early for this foolishness foolishness. And she reminds Christine that they have lunch plans later on and off Christine and Rhoda go to the picnic. As they walk away, we see Leroy griping about Monica saying she's not long for the world, but he talks about Mrs. Penmark, who's Christine. She says, now there's a quality lady. And he's really creepy here. And and he says, and her husband's gone too. And you're like, okay, you're... <laughs> Tone it down, dude. <laughs> yeah. And then he says, Rhoda is a smart little girl, almost as smart as he is. And he says, he sees through her and she sees through me. Mm-hmm. Later, we we're at the picnic and it's being held at a park with a huge kind of lake. Yeah, I was going to say in the middle, but I don't know if it's in the middle, but it's at a park with a lake. 
And a little girl uh, runs toward the water, but an adult stops her and tells her and the rest of the kids that they are not allowed near the water. I think this was <laughs> like for the kids, but also for the uh, for the audience watching. We're like, oh, OK, they're in danger now. Mm-hmm. Um, Christine walks up to Rhoda's teacher, Mrs. Fern, and Rhoda gives her a perfect curtsy. Uh, Christine asks for a moment to talk to Mrs. Fern about Rhoda. Uh, and she asks questions like, does she get along with other kids? And she, she's concerned here. She's like, she's always perfect. And is she always perfect in everything she does? And she says that uh, Rhoda has a mature aspect about her personality that is disturbing in a child. And Mrs. Fern seems to be avoiding the questions. Did you notice that? Like, she's like, how yeah. so? What do you mean? Oh, I know what you say. Yeah, I think she was definitely trying to brush off Christine for sure and not to actually be like because how do you tell a mom that your kid is not just a bully but everyone hates your child and she's like I don't want to get into this she's like oh I'm so busy I gotta go yeah and Christine can sense that there's something wrong but like Mm -hmm. you were saying nobody's being real with her yeah you know they're not just being truthful you know later at lunch with Monica and her brother Emery uh, and their friend Reggie Tasker they discuss Mm -hmm. psychology and Monica's actually, uh, so Monica's going on about how she met Freud and she was um, psychoanalyzed by another famous doctor. And then her brother, Emery, says, Monica's been spread out on couches from New York to London. And I was <laughs> like, oh, okay. I see that they're, they're being a little, a little cheeky. Mm-hmm. So Tasker is a true crime writer and talks about his latest subject, Mrs. Allison, who was an angel of death, who that an angel of death is a nurse who kills her patients and thinks it's a mercy. So I thought this was fascinating because in my mind, I've always thought of this true crime wave that we have going on this like boom of true crime, like documentaries and movies and podcasts and like my favorite murder, all that sort of stuff. It was like more of a fairly recent thing, but it seems Mm -hmm. like it's always been the case that like people have always, especially women have always kind of been infatuated with, with true crime because of the, dangerous posed to them in the society. Yeah. It's like, uh, since, well, I don't know how far media can go back, but, uh, since we've had like newspapers, like true crime has been sensationalized. Uh, like that's why we had like public hangings, like around the world, like people love that. And there's a, I don't remember what episode it is, but there's a really cool, you're wrong about, uh, podcast episode that just is like, well, when did true crime start? And it's like, we don't really know, but we know as long as we've had like the written word in like pictures, we can prove it goes way, way, way back. Like Penny Dreadfuls and beyond. Like we love, oh, yeah. we love murder. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and so then Tasker asks Christine if she's read about the killings in the papers. She says only in passing and that she shies away from that sort of thing. Monica, picking up on something, says, oh, that's an interesting psychic block. She wonders out loud why Christine would shy away from talking about murders. And she says she just has an aversion to violence. She even hates the revolver that her husband keeps in the house. So, like, we're we're learning a lot right now. First, mm-hmm. we have the Chekhov's gun, right, in the first act, because it's going to come back in the later act, in the, in the last act. Then we learn that for some reason she hates talking about murder. She, so Monica asks her to associate, free associate things. And when they start talking about true crime and these murders, she starts thinking about her father. Mm. And we're going to learn why later on in the, in the movie. But I just feel like they they do a great job of like exposition dumping without really making it really like obvious. Now, don't get me wrong. They do some obvious shit later <laughs> on, you know. But like I, I just think right here it was done kind of expertly well. Yeah, because I think this is a great – like this conversation at this point in the movie is one that hits so much harder if you've already seen it. Like to go back to your other point, like if re- you rewatch the bad seed, they're laying all these little like nuggets uh, that perfectly plays into what we find out later on, which I didn't catch that this was like everything they say is like a vital information point. Uh, where I'm like, they're just talking about some Freud shit. All right, where's the murder? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so then we find out that her father, Richard Bravo, we learned he was a famous true crime writer. And she says that she's always had the feeling that she was adopted and her parents weren't really her parents. But she had no evidence. It was only dreams. So trying to take the heat off of Christine, Emery says the lady who takes the cake was Bessie Danker, who Reggie says is the most amazing woman in all the annals of homicide. At the mention of the name Bessie Danker, Christine perks up 
And Tasker says she was beautiful and ruthless and never killed anyone the same way. Christine is uncomfortable again with the topic and asks Monica for help clearing the table. And the men, of course, jump and help as well. Oh, no, they don't. They instead go and listen to the radio to check the weather for tomorrow. The newscaster comes on and is interrupted to make an announcement of the death by drowning of a child who was at the picnic, whose name is being held pending notification of the parents. This causes Christine to go into a panic. And Monica grabs her and says, it was it was not Rhoda. She was too self-reliant. Whatever the fuck that means. You can be self-reliant and drown. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, Monica. So it was, she said it was some timid asshole confused with his own shadow. Her words, like literally her words. Mm-hmm. Uh, finally, the news announces the name of the drowned kid, Claude Deagle, the only son of Henry and Hortense Deagle. He even details how the boy died, saying he fell into the water from the pier, but no one knows how he got there as all the children were instructed to stay away from there. And there's absolutely no way that Rhoda did that. And we assure you she would never do anything like that. Like this is one of those parts where they're like telegraphing it to you. Yeah. yeah. So they're laying it on pretty thick here, uh, which is one of the problems that I have with this movie. Um, Mm -hmm. This movie is great, but if I were to say one of the things, it would would be that, that that bothers me. The other thing that bothers me, and I don't know if you, if you noticed this, but, because this was based off of a play and we have the two main actresses from the play who originated the parts, the director didn't give them any um, direction as far as comes to the parts. Like he didn't tell them to tone it down from the play to the movie version. So you can see like, she's projecting from like, they'd say like, you have to, you have to speak to the back row. Right. right. And so you can tell her there's that she's doing that. And even, um, Hortense does it as well. But I, I love Hortense. She did no wrong. She is, uh, perfect. She, she is perfect in all aspects, but <laughs> she is well, like she, she's pointing like right in her face. And like, you'd only do that if like you were on stage and you needed somebody to see that, you know? Yeah. So that, it helps it and it hurts it because it, it helps it because you feel like you're not really like, it feels kind of otherworldly or something eerie about it. It's, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. But, but then also sometimes it takes me out of it as well, you know? So I don't know. It was just a, a weird thing about the movie. Yeah. I think uh, like on that point, I think, I think where it works best is when the director relies on like wide shots because then it, the, the screen itself is literally full and every character is doing something interesting. But sometimes when it's a close up, like it can work and you can feel like, oh, I'm really buying into these like hysterics. But then at other times it kind of, yeah, like to bring back the twin peaks of it all, it gets a little bit on that level of right. Or like, like how, wait, how long are we going to be crying here? Like how long is this going to last? But at the end of the day, like it's still captivating. If I uh, if I titled episodes based uh, instead of just the name of the the show or the yeah. name of the movie, it would be the Twin Peaks of it all. The Twin Peaks of it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh man. So the 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 news announcer says that there were bruises on the forehead and hands of the child, mm-hmm. but it's assumed that they came from the pilings in the water. Christine is worried that she doesn't know what to say to Rhoda, as she remembers when she was younger, her life changing when a beloved teacher died. And I'm thinking, hmm, did Christine have something to do with that? <laughs> I don't know. Because if it's hereditary, how likely is it to to move from, uh, like, to skip one generation and go to the next one, you know? Yeah. And every, it seems like everything in this movie has a, a reason why it was said. I don't think there's wasted sentences in here. And yeah. so I, I really think there was so, there was something to it. Um, but that's just my, it's just my theory, you know? Yeah, I mean, she... As we later find out, like, she does psychically block out a lot of her life. So, like, who knows? Maybe she did one murder and then blacked it out. And then that's why she has the aversion. And she's, like, so against it because she did break and then was like, nope, never again. (laughs) Right. Because, like, why else would you go to such an extreme measure as what she does later on in the movie to to, to sort of end the cycle of of the violence that's happening, you know? Yeah. Because she knows... Because she went through it as well, you know. And that's just that's just what I'm thinking. But yeah, it's fun to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So then Christine goes to meet uh, Rhoda at the door, and Rhoda tells her what happened and mentions that they didn't eat lunch because of it. Christine says that she's glad she's home and goes to hug Rhoda, but Rhoda again walks away from the physical touch and asks for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich instead. <laughs> so Christine is thrown off by how nonchalant Rhoda is acting right now. And she tells Rhoda to get the images of Claude's death out of her head, which Rhoda says, 
Uh, it was exciting and not scary at all. And she asks for her sandwich again. Uh, Christine goes to make it and Rhoda goes to her room and puts on her roller skates. Mm. Um, so in the meantime, Leroy has come to collect the trash around the house, again, walking in without knocking. And Leroy tries to talk with Christine about the tragedy, but she rushes him. Uh, I'm sorry. She shushes him and he goes away. Rhoda sits to eat her sandwich with milk. And Christine says, I know how you're feeling. And Rhoda says, I don't understand what you mean. I don't feel anything at all. And this surprises Christine and Rhoda realizes this and quickly goes to hug her mother and starts to kiss her hand. This also surprises Christine and she asks Rhoda if she's been naughty and Rhoda denies be, uh, being so. So this leads me to the conclusion that like Rhoda doesn't like being physically touched unless she's in trouble, in which case she goes and, and gives affection because she knows that people will, for, will forgive her if she does so. It's a learned it's a learned trait. Yeah. And so she goes and kisses her mom's hand, her mom's hand. And, and Christine's like, oh, she only does this when she's done something wrong. So what's the wrong thing she did? You know, mm -hmm. so it's uh, just the little things, you know. I also love uh, speaking of the <laughs> Rhoda's reaction to Claude's death. I love this line. Why should I feel sorry? It was Claude Daigle who got drowned, not me. <laughs> I'm like, Damn. <laughs> Cold blooded. Cold blooded, right? Oh, so good. So um, then she backs up and she asks, what would you give me for a basket of kisses? This knocks Christine out of her worry. And she responds, a basket full of hugs. Mm -hmm. So Rhoda goes outside to finish her sandwich. And Leroy finishes up in the apartment and walks outside where Rhoda is. He immediately starts talking shit to her. And she says, why are you going skating instead of being sad in your room? It's almost as if you're not sorry that he died. And that's when she says, why should I be sorry? <laughs> Uh, and then like she skates off with her with her sandwich with her peanut butter sandwich not even peanut butter and jelly can you imagine how dry your mouth is just peanut butter yeah i was also skating while eating a peanut butter sandwich what weird. it's a pretty baller move I, you know i gotta give it to <laughs> all all she needed was like to put on her glasses oh, her and just have like yeah and just like skate away <laughs> so then leroy calls after her that he'll find a way to scare her so later at night, Christina is reading Rhoda a bedtime story, but her heart really isn't in it, and she trails off. She's thinking about Claude Deagle again. She again starts to read, but uh, asks Rhoda if she's taken her vitamins. Rhoda says uh, she's taken one and is saving the other as she likes the flavor. This mm -hmm. perfect little girl. Do you know what this gave me? Have you, have you seen Get Out? Yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert for Get Out. If you haven't seen it yet, um, come back in a minute. <laughs> but at the end of Get Out, when um, the I forget the the, the girlfriend's name, um, she's eating cereal. Oh and she, yes! But she's just eating it like she has the milk in one hand and the cereal in the other hand, and she's taking a little bite of cereal and then drinking milk. Ooh, yeah. That's what this was giving me. Oh God, it's so creepy. Yeah, hundred percent. Creepy behavior around food, like automatic. There's something wrong with you. You're, in, in a movie, in a movie, in a movie. In a movie you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So soon she drifts off to sleep as Christine keeps reading to her. Sometime later, Christine is visited by Miss Fern, the teacher from Rhoda School, while Rhoda practices practices her piano in the background. Miss Fern says that everyone at the school is puzzled at how everything went down, and they're just trying to figure out what happened. She also says that she's just come from seeing Mrs. Deagle. And she says Mrs. Deagle will have to live with what happened for the rest of her days. And she says that Mrs. Deagle wanted her to ask Christine if she knows what happened to the penmanship medal, as it was not with the body. At the mention of the medal, the music stops and Rhoda walks out of the room. I thought this was funny because I, I caught it a little bit in the first watch, but really on the second watch, was, I was like, oh, shit. She was listening in when she was playing the piano. And as soon as she heard about the penmanship medal, she's like, nope. I'm out of here. And yeah. she just stopped listening. I, I, I had, did you catch that? Not, not okay. until you said it, but okay. yeah, I think that she does something similar later on. And I was like, wait a second. Um, but I didn't catch that first one. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, she, she walks out to her mother and uh, the teacher, Mrs. Fern, and she gives another perfect curtsy and asks her mother in the perfect child way, if she may go outside to read under the tree, she names a tree, but I forget the name of the tree. Yeah. Uh, because she loves to be where her mother can see her. And it's like, okay. And uh, the book is called Elsie Dinsmore. And I looked up a little bit about it. And it's apparently it's about, it's a real book. 
about a, a like a quote unquote real girl, like uh, or, I'm sorry, a good girl as like good quote unquote good girls are supposed to be. You know. So after Rhoda walks outside, the women continue discussing the death. Miss Fern informs Christine that Rhoda was the last person to see Claude Deagle alive. This comes as news to Christine. Miss Fern goes on to say that several times that morning, Rhoda was stopped from following Claude around and trying to take the metal away from him. Until at last, Claude started crying. She's a bully. Yeah, she sucks. <laughs> so shortly before Claude's body was discovered, the guard saw a little blonde girl with pigtails and a dress walking away from where the body was discovered. And Rhoda was the only girl not wearing jeans that day. So Miss Fern go- goes back and forth here saying that this was no big deal and children lie and accidents happen, but also acting as if Rhoda may have killed Claude. Mm-hmm. And she says Claude may have hidden in the boathouse and when Rhoda found him, he may have backed away and fallen in the water. She goes on to say that Rhoda probably didn't say anything because she was scared to admit it, just like anybody would be. Um, she does believe Rhoda had something to do with it, but insists that isn't a serious charge. So what what did you get from Miss Fern here? Like, what were you feeling from her? So I think a couple of things. I think that what she planned to gently suggest was that there, there was a disagreement. Maybe Rhoda pushed Claude off. He hit his head and he drowned. Uh, and to be like, it's fine if that happened. We just need to know. I don't want to say it because I don't want you to like, at this point, at least, I don't want you to pull your kid from my school because I, I, they never quite say it. I just assumed it was a private school. Mm-hmm. They like paid money, especially because they're like a like richer family. Um, but I also think it's something that is like, like, especially for the time, it's so terrible to suggest that this kid had anything to do with the murder that she, she can't even bear herself to say it like accident or not. I don't think deep down she thinks it was an accident because she's seen how much of a bully Rhoda is that and maybe Rhoda just went one step too far. But it's like one of those things where it's like almost too horrible for her to say it. Um, yeah, at least at that point in time. Yeah. yeah. So what and I, and I thought what you thought as well. But then later on, like in the second watch and, and um, the mother, um, Mrs. Daigle even says it like there's also the liability factor about it, right? Because yeah, they're yeah. on their land and the, the child died on their land. So she has to be careful with what she says, right. which, so then um, that's why like Christine is picking up on this weird energy. And she's like, um, she says that Chris, Christine is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Rhoda has lied to her. And Miss Fern says that, you know, which adult wouldn't lie? Like who, who, who doesn't lie? Right. And she even says not to furrow. Uh, she tells my, um, Christine, not to furrow her brow so much. She's prettier when she smiles. And I was like, ooh, okay, we're we're, we're going there. Internalized misogyny much, you know? Mm-hmm. So Christine says that she will ask Rhoda, but then she remembers that the children sent a floral arrangement to Claude's, to Claude's parents, but Christine wasn't asked to contribute anything. Miss mm-hmm. Fern says, yes, that's correct. We thought that you might like to send your own arrangement of flowers to them. And this confuses Christine. And she says, why would they do such a thing? They hardly knew them. And Miss Fern seems awkward here and says, well, she doesn't know. But Christine says, you're saying one thing, but acting another. The way, you know, you and I, we picked up on. And she says, do you and your sisters believe that there's a connection between Rhoda and Claude's death? And Miss Fern says she refuses to believe there's any connection. Mm-hmm. But then she, she says perhaps they have acted as if there was a connection. So Christine says if there's any shadow over Rhoda, then there's a sh- that's the shadow that she has to live under and also her husband. Um, and furthermore, Rhoda will not be happy at school next year, and Miss Fern agrees. Mm-hmm. But she can't offer an explanation as to why, except for Rhoda's behavior in the matter of the metal. Just then, the doorbell rings and our lives are forever changed. <laughs> because we meet Hortense Daigle. Ugh, icon. <laughs> so I want you to tell me what you think of Hortense Daigle. Okay, I think, so, uh, so many things, so many beloved things. Um, I think off the bat that the first thing that comes to mind is it is so hard to act intoxicated on camera and make it seem believable without it going straight into camp or without it being like 
just too just too much and like <laughs> she is a lot but like even amidst like her like drunken slurs and like oh just the pitch perfect stumble when she first walks in so when yes. she first walks in you're like okay hello new character and then it's like this little stumble and then she catches herself and she's like oh sorry guys i'm drunk don't mind me don't mind me <laughs> and she kind of i think she really is playing the fool a little bit and on purpose mm. uh, but then there's these great deliveries where <laughs> she'll just be so straight and stern in her voice um and the way that sometimes when someone gets drunk is where all of a sudden she's just like i'm not the least bit intoxicated and it's just like she has such command over her voice and those little those little switches uh and then she goes into like about like these emotional bouts with christine that are so lovely because you can tell that like underneath that yeah like she's a mess but like she's grieving and she's really having a hard time processing the loss of her son and also she believes deep down that like Rhoda has something to do with this and she doesn't she definitely doesn't fault Christine which is interesting until later I think later when she then realizes Christine is aware of what has happened then she really like condemns her but up until that point she's just like really really wanting to um give her the benefit of the doubt and I was like what a what a multifaceted character like she doesn't come in here like you said it's not like a dude coming in knocking over the liquor cart and like brawling on the couch you know she's just like I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Don't mind me. Get me a drink doll. <laughs> like, let's chat. Let's try to figure it out. And I just think like, God, she just commands the screen. And it's, I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> yeah. And I love what you said about like, um, kind of playing the fool yeah. because there, there is a bit of a like Columbo aspect of it. And I'm showing my age because so, you might yeah. not know who Columbo <laughs> is, but, um, there's a bit of that aspect. And it, this is definitely like a, a verbal sparring match. Right? Yes. Like she's like trying to catch somebody in a lie or trying to get some information that people don't want to give her. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just absolutely love, love this character. And in both scenes that she shows up in, um, I just thought it was just fantastically done. Just absolutely amazing job. And it's, yeah. I I hate to say that it was a bit of a comedic element because it wasn't because she's still obviously very um, emotionally distraught, but mm-hmm there's something comedic about a drunk person, you know, like, yeah. Right? And, and I feel like the first time you see Hortense, I mean, it's not, I don't know if it's written this way, but the, the way I got it is like, I think it's, I think the second time you see her, I do think that she's like sloshed, like beyond sloshed. Um, but I do think that the first time we see her, I don't think she's as drunk as she's letting on and she's using that to her advantage and kind of leaning into it and like making fun of herself and letting us laugh at her. Cause she's like, Oh, what a mess. Oh, I'm, I'm too much. I'm too much. Did I mention I was drunk? I'm drunk everybody. Uh, and I feel like that's what lets us feel like, okay, about laughing at her a little bit. Cause she seems like in on the joke a little. And then later it's just, I feel like it's just tragic. I'm like, Oh, Hortense. <laughs> I like that. I hadn't thought about that, but I like the fact that, um, Rhoda isn't the only one who can be cunning, you know, yeah, and and yeah. deceitful, you know, I like that yeah. a lot. So okay, so we're introduced to Hortense Daigle, the the um the dead boy's mother, mm-hmm. and she stumbles into the apartment drunk and barely able to walk in a straight line, followed closely by Henry Daigle, her embarrassed husband. Uh, Mrs. Daigle sarcastically observes that Christine is her so is her social superior. It's an honor that Christine hastily disclaims and then point uh then comes to the point of her visit. She demands to know what became of the penmanship medal that she pinned on her son herself. Mm-hmm. And what Miss Fern, uh, concerned as she probably is with liability issues, won't reveal to her. Mm-hmm. Mr. Daigle says that she's not herself, but she says, I know what I am about just the same. Mm-hmm. So that's what I think what you're saying there is like she might be playing the fool a little bit here. Mm-hmm. So Mrs. Daigle also reveals that Claude, when found, had bruises on his hand and a crescent moon-shaped wound on his forehead. Um, In the end, Mrs. Daigle becomes terrifically angry and then almost collapses in tears, allowing her otherwise ineffectual husband to lead her away. After Hortense leaves, Christine and Miss Fern have a tearful parting. Um, And one of the things that she says in this time was, um, she says, Children can be so nasty, don't you think? I was like, okay. So mm-hmm. she's, she's, because she was saying that they made fun of her name, Hortense, but she was like, and she's like, uh, children can be so nasty. But 
and and I was just and I kind of said this earlier, like she's in so much pain and on the surface, she's trying to make, remain cordial, but underneath she's furious and she's a mom asking for help from another mom. She's desperate and she doesn't get any. And then she, there's also that anecdote she was saying about her son where uh, her, her son told her that she was so pretty and that he wanted to marry her. <laughs> and she's like, Oh no, you'll forget about me when you grow up and you'll, you'll find a prettier girl. And he said, there's not a prettier girl in the world than you are. Uh, and that was so touching, you know. It was so touching because you're like, he literally can't find another person. He'll never get married. And you're just like, you're, it's like subtly reminds the audience. You're like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. After after everything and they're leaving, um, as they're walking out, he apo- the, the husband apologizes and she goes, oh, who cares what they think? And she leaves. I'm like, what a performance. What an absolute performance from her. And um, shortly after this, Colonel Penmark calls to ask about the accident and to reveal that his Washington assignment will last at least another four weeks. Mm -hmm. Monica comes over and asks Christine to lend her the locket that she had given Rhoda so that she can have its gemstone changed. And Christine goes to her uh, treasure chest to find it. And she's horrified to find the penmanship medal in there as well. So then uh, she gives Monica the the necklace and she leaves and then she asks for Rhoda to come inside. Then she she then shows the medal to Rhoda and demands that Rhoda explain how she came by the medal. Rhoda's face when she sees the medal is great. And she's like, she says, where did you find it? Like she loses, she forgets that she's supposed to be, have this particular affectation, you know, she, her real self comes out. Rhoda at first tries to change the subject then denies that she had the medal at all, then tells a variety of stories that Christine recognizes as false almost at once, and finally says that she had somehow persuaded Claude to let her hold the medal and then had gone out onto the pier and and fallen in later on. So while she's talking about Claude giving her the medal on the pier, she has put on her shoes with the iron heels and is knocking them together. And it's a bit of like psychology there, perhaps, because that's the weapon that she used, you know, to kill him. Uh, which is something I did not notice the first walkthrough. So in between these activities, Rhoda indulges in a bit of flattery that now seems anything but flattering. She says, I've got the prettiest mother. I've got the nicest mother, et cetera, et cetera. Then Christine recalls a fatal accident that had happened to a neighbor in Wichita, Kansas, an accident by which Rhoda came into possession of a keepsake belonging to the neighbor. She promised it to her when she died, and a, le- and a week later, she was in fact dead. Afterwards, she asked that neighbor's daughter for the crystal ball. And so Christine asks, br- brings that up and then uses it to ask her if she knew anything about Claude's drowning. And then Rhoda denies that. She says, why, why would you ask? So then Christine Christine finally announces her intention to call Miss Fern, intending to surrender the medal. But Rhoda, in a frightened tone, begs her not to, saying that the school officials don't like her and were persecuting her. Miss Fern is not available, and, and Rhoda seems to care most of all about retaining the medal, insisting that she, not Claude, had actually earned it. So one thing that I read uh, in the trivia about this was that in the I don't know if it was in the novel or in the play that the award wasn't for best penmanship. It was for most improved penmanship. And she's always had amazing penmanship. So you, whereas Claude had bad penmanship and then improved. And so she never would have been able to win it. And so in the, in the book, you are able to like her less because you're like, she should, she obviously could not have won. Whereas, um, in the movie, it's more objective whether or not she could win or not, right? Because it's just like, I, I like this better than this. So Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, because I feel like mm, it's like, yeah, I agree that the book version is way darker because it never would have been hers. And this one, it's like, it suggested that maybe it, it could have been, but that maybe it wasn't given to her because Miss Fern just didn't like her for being a bully, you know, like how teachers do that sometimes. They're like, yeah, you get, you had the best, you had the best assignment, but I don't like you. So you're not getting the prize. Yeah. And I kind of loved thinking about that. Miss Fern just being like, no, I'm not going to reward you. You're the worst. <laughs> Nobody likes you. So back in Washington, Colonel Penmark buys an expensive children's tea set for Rhoda and has it shipped to, has it shipped to her packed in excelsior i think this was the first movie where i find i found out that excelsior was a term other than like what stanley used it used it for 
like it's an actual thing. It's like a packing material. Yeah, I had no idea what it was. And I was like, what? Why is everyone saying else? Like, like I can't even say it. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, like, why are you saying this? What? Do you mean just like bubble wrap? <laughs> like, yeah, it's just like wood shavings. Oh, but so I actually looked it up like well, the first time I watched this movie. I was like, what the fuck yeah. is that? So then Rhoda goes out to play with the tea set and takes the packing material with her. And Leroy sees her at play and begins his scare campaign by accusing her, her by accusing her of beating Claude Dago with a stick and saying that she could never clean a murder weapon enough to remove all trace of blood, that the police have quote unquote stick bloodhounds that can find a thrown away stick in any forest, and that they also have a laboratory that will sprinkle that will sprinkle blood powder on a blood soaked stick and make it turn blue. So I think this is where like she doesn't she's not old enough to understand that this is all bullshit. Yeah. Right. Like a, an adult is telling her something. And even though she takes most of what he says with a grain of salt, this particular thing, because she doesn't know any better, she believes him with that. And I thought it was a pretty funny story to tell or not funny, pretty ingenious story to tell. Yeah. So Rhoda, for her part, throws the Excelsior at Leroy and tells him to clean it up, which I, which I thought was hilarious. Um, she also says that she knows about the bed of Excelsior that Leroy has made for himself so that he can sleep on the job in the furnace room without being caught. Nor is she afraid of his accusations, saying that he made them all up. So Christine catches Leroy talking to Rhoda and warns him never to speak to her again or she will report him to Monica. He, uh, we then see Leroy walking into the cellar with the Excelsior and use it to make his bed fluffier. It's such a sad thing, right? It's very sad. But I don't, I, I, I don't, I, I can't think that he lives there. It's just a way to take a nap at work. Yeah. And I had a question for you. Have you ever, pr- your prior, your prior <laughs> employers, when you were a teenager, nothing now, never, never now. <laughs> But have you ever slept on the job? I, I will first off say I have. So you can feel comfortable. I'm not going to be like, wow, I can't believe you did that. But like, ha- have you ever slept on a job? I, I haven't slept on a job, but as a as a teen, yeah, throughout high school, I worked like four years at Boston Market. Um, <laughs> and our love, love and bless his heart, um, uh, me and uh, my friend at the time, Stacy, we'd always like take the chocolate chip cookies when they were out of the oven and just go back there and eat them and we're talking. And he would just be like, stop. And we'd be like, and we'd just look at him and then just would keep talking. <laughs> I was like, I could, I don't even, I do not have that teenage energy now to get away with that. But yeah, yeah. I ate cookies in the job. Okay. Well, it's, it's theft. It's theft on the <laughs> job, just like sleeping on the job. So we're all there. <laughs> but I, I, I used to work uh, when I was like 17 or 18. I had a, a no, uh, senior in high school, I had a job in a, at a company that had a warehouse connected to it. It was very much like the office. Mm. And and so um, I stayed late. I stayed till like six or seven. And by the time everybody left, like I was the last one in the building, even the warehouse workers. Uh, and so I, I had a little spot that I would go to to fall asleep. <laughs> and I don't know if you ever watched The Office, but in The Office, there's a scene where one of the... Um, uh, warehouse workers talks about having a spot that he has that, that he goes to to sleep <laughs> and how it's so nice and soothing because there's just this hum of electrical equipment around you and it kind of <laughs> lulls you to sleep. That's exactly what happened to me. I would like go there and for like the last two hours of my work work day, I would like just fall asleep. Not every day, just like when I was, you know, every now and then. Yeah. yeah. And I, they also had a forklift that I taught myself how to drive and I would just wow. do, be doing wheelies. And I don't know why they left me by myself in there. They should not have done. I definitely could have caused some damage to it. But, um, I digress. So back to the movie. When Rhoda comes back into the house, she asks her mother about police tests for blood. And Christine offers to ask Miss Fern about it. But again, Rhoda uh, does not want Christine to ask her. So Christine instructs Rhoda to go up to Mrs. Breedlove's apartment for dinner while the famous psychiatrist Reginald Tasker arrives for cocktails. Tasker is a creep. He says he likes to see little girls curtsy and touches one of her ponytails. That's what I was saying when when uh, Christine, or I'm sorry, when Rhoda comes back in, he she curtsies to him. And he's like, oh, I love to see like a little girl and she's going to make some man very happy. Oh, like, so fuck creepy. you, dude. He's like, she's eight. So don't marry her off to be some child bride. Get out. <laughs> and th- this is why he like, he touches one of her br- uh, braids. It's a uh, pigtails. She touches one of her pigtails. And then like, so she had them both on the front of her. But when he moves, when he touches her braid, he puts it behind her. And then she, she excuses herself. She leaves and she flips her pigtail back 
the way she originally had it. I'm like, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> But she, he shouldn't have been touching her, like especially since that's the first time. It's different if you're a family friend and you come to see yeah. him and give a hug or something like that. There's some affection between both of you, but you just met this little girl. Like, why are you touching her? Yeah, that's weird. Christine tells uh, Tasker that her father, the famous uh, true crime author Richard Bravo, will be joining them for dinner or for a drink anyway. So Mr. Tasker reveals that he has great respect for Christine's father, who had been quite an authority on crime and criminals in his younger days. Christine says she is thinking of writing a book and wanted to ask him if children commit murders. He says that, yes, they do, just like child prodigies and other aspects. <laughs> so her father arrives and he and Tasker engage in good-natured professional sparring and also discuss, Kath, uh, I'm sorry, also discuss Christine's own dreams of writing a murder mystery, which she doesn't really have. It. She's just using it as a guise to ask about about Rhoda. And then her dad is surprised and she and he says, Well, she can't even spell. Yeah. Like, it's like, yeah. I think that's like dad energy right there. You know? Yeah. So then uh, Christine insists that criminals are made in bad environments. But Tasker says that some criminals are born that way, that they are bad seeds, possessing atavistic conscious minds and even that one might inherit tenant inherits a tendency to criminality. Um her father refuses to accept to accept such a theory, but Tasker politely stands by his theory and even states that a child criminal would not present a sour countenance at all, but would instead present a quite convincing, normal and innocent manner. Mm. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then the conversation turns to the case of Bessie Denker, one of Richard Bravo's own case history subjects. And this is the lady that we heard about earlier that caused Christine to, to perk up. So Bravo wants to avoid the subject, but Christine insists and Tasker reveals that Miss Denker vanished without a trace before the authorities could make an arrest. Tasker even remembers that Miss Denker left a child behind, a part of the story that Bravo hastily denies. Shortly after making this revelation, Tasker leaves. So at this point, I, I was a bit slow mm. uh, to the point. So... At this point, um, what were you feeling? Like, were you catching with what they were putting, you know, were you picking up what they were putting down, basically? Yeah, but I thought it was going to go in a different direction. I thought because her father was assigned to this court case to cover, uh, and I guess she never made it to court, I guess. I was a little confused about that. I'm like, wait, what? Um, mm-hmm. But following this person and writing about her, writing true crime about her, I thought it was going to go down the path that. He had an, an affair with her, uh, whether or not he was married at the time. I thought that, uh, like, his, he'd be spending so much time with the subject, like, in a, like a Truman Capote way, right? Like, that he would fall in love with the subject because he was so fascinated by it, even though she's a murderer, and that that, that was what was going to happen. I did not expect what we learn in the upcoming scene. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then the, Christine and her father are alone together. Mr. Bravo asks Christine what's wrong because she, he, she, he sees the worry on her face. Christine starts to talk freely of her fear of having been an adopted child and not the actual daughter of Richard Bravo. Christine also says that her concerns about Rhoda have prompted a return of that old fear. She mentions a recurring nightmare that she had, but her father clearly does not want to discuss it. And he especially does not want Christine to lend any credence to the inherited criminality theory. She desperately needs to know if she's adopted. And she says now she knows she has her answer because her father won't come out and say that she wasn't adopted. Mm-hmm. I think this is a really touching scene because he goes on to say how lucky he was to have her to, to get her as a daughter, you know? Yeah. I, I really love that too. Cause like, uh, I won't go too much into it, but as someone who like, um, my dad that I grew up with adopted me when I was like four. Uh, and I remember having not that conversation, but like similar iterations of that come up as you grow up. It wasn't something that was ever um, hidden for me for too long or whatever. And I felt like it was handled. I mean, it's still very stagey, but it was handled pretty deftly. And I also really appreciated that, like, they had that in there because I think if they didn't, they risked the danger of it being like, don't want to adopt kids because one of them could be a bad seed. And they, they even have a line in there where, like, when they're talking about the nature versus nurture debate, one of them is just like, well, we can't believe this because then kids will just be orphans forever. And, it, and I was like, oh, I like that you're at least acknowledging that. And you're being like, not all, not all, 
like you're not fated to be um, a bad seed if you don't have parents. I feel like that's a very old way of thinking. Um, right. Yeah. I really like that. That was cool. So now Mr. Bravo finally reveals that he did find Christine in a very strange place. Then Christine reveals her recurring nightmare about living in a farmhouse with her brother and a very beautiful lady. Then not having a brother anymore. Then being terrified of being in the room. Then being outside in an orchard. Finally, she remembers the name she originally had. Her name was not Christine Bravo at all, but Ingle Denker, Bessie Denker's daughter. What what a name. Like She definitely got a, a come up on the name just in itself, you know? Yeah. Um, so this then is the truth. Richard Bravo found Ingle Denker, whom he renamed Christine, in the orchard on the Denker farm after Bessie Denker had uh, disappeared. But Christine now feels that she would have done better to die because she's afraid that she inherited a tendency to extreme criminality from her real mother, Bessie Denker, and passed this on to her own daughter. You can really see the bones of the play here because Nancy Kelly is playing Christine here just as she would on stage. That's how it felt like to me. It was overly dramatized with a lot of exaggerated movement. It felt very like German expressionistic, like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari or, or something like that. Just like yeah. exaggerated movements, you know? Yeah. Like her whole body, like she throws her whole body into her dad as if she like all of a sudden doesn't have legs. <laughs> You're like, what just happened? You yeah. don't understand anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That that leads to like the, the uneasiness of it as well. But, but yeah. like I said, it takes you out sometimes. So um, this is one of the criticisms that people have about the movie. Mm-hmm. As we talked about earlier, it's about the, the, the play versus movie acting aspect of it. So mm-hmm. uh, at this moment, Monica returns with Rhoda. And Rhoda greets her grandfather cheerfully, but now Richard takes a long, hard look at his granddaughter, though he will not explain why. So he agrees to stay in a spare room in Monica's apartment overnight. Later, Christine catches Rhoda trying to dispose of something in a paper bag. And for me, it was a pretty comedic, like, tiptoe out of her room. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, <laughs> are you Bugs Bunny? <laughs> <laughs> And Rhoda doesn't want to reveal the contents of the bag. So Christine has to actually struggle with her. And it must have been a strong ass little girl because they're struggling, struggling for a while, trying to snatch this bag out of her hands. Yeah. And we come to find out that what she's been, what she was trying to dispose of were her shoes with the iron half moon reinforcements. Mm -hmm. Um, Now Christine knows the terrible truth and, and is able to extract a confession from Rhoda. Rhoda killed Claude Daigle by beating him with her shoes after he had refused to let her handle his penmanship medal. And she says, I'd hit him with my shoe if he didn't give me that medal. (laughs) Just like that. And after the first blow, Claude surrendered the medal and then tried to escape. And Rhoda struck him again and again until he fell in the water. When he tried to climb back onto the warp, Rhoda beat the backs of his hands with her shoes to make him let go. And so he drowned. What a terrible way to go. Like, can you imagine? Horrible way. This it's, little kid is just like, I. It, it's just a penmanship medal, like here. Yeah, I like what's so tragic too is like when you're listening to her describe the death, like I'm at first thought I was going to be like, she like hit him in the head and he fell into the water and then she's like, oh, well, I got the medal. But no, 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 she like beats him. He gives her like what she wants, but then she's afraid that people will find out that she did what she did. So then she beats him for like, like threatening to tell on her. And then like literally... <laughs> falls into water and then climbs back up to save his own life and then she's like i was like so sickened by the sounds he was making like she's like he just wouldn't stop like crying and i i couldn't take that noise and you're like oh like that's that's what gets me when she's just like like he was crying and screaming and she was like i didn't like it i didn't like that sound and you're like what she says like what's that meme where like the, there's a face looking down in you and it just says pathetic yeah like, <laughs> that's how she was thinking about him yeah jesus rhoda so then Rhoda goes to hug her mother again when she's in trouble. She goes, tries to get affection or physical touch from her mother and says, oh, I've got the prettiest mother. I've got the nicest mother. And it's so fucking creepy. Yeah. And she tries to do the whole basket of kisses shit, but that doesn't fly at this moment. It's like, read the room, Rhoda. Like you, you know. <laughs> and she says, Christine tells her not to tell anybody. With, yeah. And then Rhoda confesses, or Rhoda says, why would I tell and get killed? So again, Christine asks about the neighbor in Wichita and Rhoda confesses 
that she had in fact deliberately caused their neighbor in Wichita to fall on some ice and then down the stairs. Christine, totally distraught, instructs Rhoda to throw the shoes into the incinerator and say nothing to anyone, which she does. Rhoda again asks about the medal, and Christine half promises not to give the medal back to Miss Fern. But I wanted to think about this. So they've been in, so they lived in Wichita before, and now they're where, or wherever they're at. And they've been there for at least a couple of years because they have this like very close relationship with with their landlady, right? So because she says she loves them and all that. At least, let's say two years yeah. minimum. So she was six years old when she killed somebody. And we don't even know if that was her first kill, you know? We don't. <laughs> It's child prodigy, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. It's amazing. <laughs> so the next morning, Richard leaves and Le- uh, Leroy again tries to tease Rhoda. This time, Leroy says that if the police find the stick with which she killed Claude, they'll sentence her to death in the electric chair. And even that the police have his and her child size electric chairs. Yeah, he even says they're like uh, blue for little boys and, and pink for little girls. And it's yeah. like way to enforce gender norms, asshole. <laughs> so um, next, Leroy says that he hasn't seen her in her tap shoes. And now he says that he knows that she hit Claude Daigle with the shoes and not the stick. Mm-hmm. And even that he's retrieved them from the incinerator. He says, sure, they got burned up, but but they'll still be able to test for blood. And his delivery on these lines are just great. Like acting all around, like there wasn't a role that didn't have like, that wasn't like perfectly cast, I think. Mm -hmm. That last boast causes Rhoda to take alarm and demand that Leroy return the shoes. At last, Leroy has found something to scare her with and he presses his point. And this is where I realized that he's just been messing with her the whole time. He hasn't really thought that she killed him. She was, he was just fucking with her. Yeah. But unfortunately, he fucked around and found out, right? Mm -hmm. And so she keeps saying that she wants the shoes back. And he finally finally realizes that she did, in fact, do the deed and killed killed Claude. And that's the reason why she's scared and demanding the return of of the shoes. In fact, Leroy did not retrieve the shoes when he said he did. But after Christine chases Leroy away... From, from Rhoda a second time, Leroy opens the incinerator and finds the shoes, but it is now too afraid to say anything, and he, la- he goes and lays down on his bed. Christine, for her part, reprimands Rhoda for talking about this subject after they had agreed never to speak of it to anyone. Mm-hmm. When Monica calls to give Rhoda the locket after it has been modified, Rhoda asks permission to catch the ice cream man and buy a popsicle. On her way, Rhoda tries to steal several matches. Christine tells her to replace them, but manages to hide three of them. And immediately, she's so good at lying. She she actually calls her an adroit liar, which yeah. I didn't realize what adroit was, so I had to look it up. And it's perfect. Like, she's really good at lying, right? Yeah. And so she immediately says, oh, I just wanted to play like a matchstick game with him. And Christine's like, well, fucking put him down. We have rules for it. But yeah. she does manage to take three. Yeah, she's so quick on her feet with her lies. and. She pivots so quickly. And there's only a couple times when she's like caught off guard, but she's almost always able to think of a story that justifies what she's doing. And you're like, that is insane. And so, the, of course, this is why you're going undetected. <laughs> well, and I could just imagine, like, there are people in the world like this. And I, like, I know. and I just can imagine if she had allowed, been allowed to, to live, what kind of adult she would have been. You know, it would have been yeah. crazy. It's like... um. I know like psychopathy and sociopathy are like very different, but like for both of those, the, what like clues someone into their acting wrong is how someone else reacts. Cause in their mind, they're not, not having empathy or not having access to empathy. Like you've never lived with it. So how would you know what it feels like? But the, if you realize when you do something, it causes someone to get mad at you. You're like, Oh, I can't do that that way. So you can tell, I think the only time she gets tripped up in her lies is when she hear someone get offended or it doesn't work and she's like okay let me try another thing Uh, and i just love how that's like i think that nails like the calculation of like people that have that condition like how they problem solve in the world it's wild and how they can be propped up to positions of power yeah and and you wouldn't know bring down democracies almost yeah (laughs) so what did i say (laughs) so when rhoda leaves Monica probes Christine, knowing that something is troubling her, but not knowing what it is. And this is a very touchy moment between the two women. 
Monica offers to give Christine some sleeping pills to help her sleep and also some new vitamins. And then Monica is still sensing that something is wrong. She even asks if her and her husband had broken up. And Christine's like, no, that's not it. So uh, then Monica tells her that she, that she loves her and Christine kind of collapses in a pool of tears, but she's still afraid to tell her anything because like, think about it. Like, you, what, what are you saying? You're saying that your daughter's a murderer. Like, who do you talk to about that? Who do you have believe about that? Especially in the 1950s where, you know, men are the head of the household and, and women are just yeah. to, supposed to be, uh, you know, bringing up the children and taking care of the house. So it's like, who do I go to for this? It's very similar to like Rosemary's baby. Have you, have you seen mm-hmm. Rosemary's baby? Like how they were treating her, you know? Exactly. And then it's also like at this point, she's been concealing it. So it's like doubly bad. And it's, I know soon we're going to get into the, the Hortense part too. Uh, but that's why it's even more troubling. Cause it's like, not only did your kid commit a murder, but you made the decision despite the consequence of it, that you're going to conceal it uh, and live with that. And that's why she, she's having such a hard time. I think it's, it's great. <laughs> I mean, she even said, like, if there's a cloud over, yeah, um, over Rhoda, there's a cloud over me as well, you know. And then now she's living in that cloud. Yeah, yeah. So at that moment, Hortense Deagle again, <laughs> we get to see our fave, our problematic fave, yeah. shows up again, drunk as before. Um, do you do you want to explain what you thought when you saw her show up again? Like, were you happy as I was? I was extremely happy. I, I just love when she shows up, but I also felt like I'm like. I was like ready for the reckoning. Like I was ready for like a screaming match. But again, Hortense does something a bit different than that. Like she does get her, does get her claws out. Um, But it's like, she's really, I feel like this is like her final, her final try to get something out of her before she just gives up on Christine. And I love watching her just like push her and push her. And then get to the point and she's like, you know what? Screw you. I'm a hairdresser. I don't need your bullshit. And the best part for me at the end is like when before she leaves, she's just like, she's basically like, you look tired. Do you want a makeover? Because you look pretty bad. And that's her last thing she says before she leaves. And like you could take you could read it as like she meant it earnestly or it was like one final dig before she left. <laughs> and either way it works great. Yeah, I love it. It's like, oh, you're in need of a full beat. Like you, <laughs> she is hurting. So like, she's like, yeah, I'm going through it, but you look bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, Miss Deagle or Mrs. Deagle is seeking yet another confrontation, not only with Christine, but this time also with Rhoda. Yeah. And Hortense has by now tried to talk to Miss Fern a dozen times without result and has also been speaking to the lifeguard from the fatal picnic. What she now knows makes her firmly suspect Rhoda of something, though she's not even sure herself what she suspects. She asks for something to drink, and then when Christine rolls out the drink card, she says, oh, ain't we swank? And then she names like a fancy (laughs) hotel that I'm not remembering right now. Like she's so, um, (laughs) just talking shit. Like like there's people, like there's people in my life that I know that can talk shit to me while smiling, Mm -hmm. and it's perfectly fine, and that's what she's doing. But I, I, um, like you can't talk shit back to her because she's just lost lost a child. What are you going to do? You know, so she has a certain amount of leeway here. Yeah, you can tell Christine's aware of that too, because uh, I think at this point Monica comes oh, a little bit later. I think Monica comes and she's like she's aware that because she's like this high society lady, she has to act with like decorum at all times, and it's killing her. <laughs> yeah. So then she actually helps herself to the liquor. She doesn't even let she Christine pour a drink. She just yeah. takes the bourbon and pours like a pint of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Hortense does not succeed in getting the information she seeks or in scaring Rhoda because Monica hastily takes Rhoda away on a pretext. And she says, oh, she wasn't aware that Rhoda had all these social obligations. <laughs> She's like, I didn't know I would have to schedule an interview with Rhoda. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, oh, I thought she was just like any child who played outside and and minded her mother. But apparently she has a social calendar. Like, (laughs) God damn, snark much? But I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, She says that she's sorry she interfered with Rhoda's social life. And she apologizes to Christine and says she would apologize to Rhoda uh, for, for interfering. But hopefully she can get on her calendar to do so. So just then the phone rings and 
Christine has to cross the room to pick it up. And I don't know if you noticed this, but when she picks it up, like she picks it up very jarringly and her face looks like, like she's about to crack. Mm -hmm. Like everything's coming down in her at this moment. And if something else were to happen, she might've just cracked at that moment. But what it was, it was actually Mr. Deagle looking for, uh, looking for Mrs. Deagle. And Christine tells him that she's, that she is there. Mm -hmm. So, Mrs. Deagle does does succeed in, in frightening Christine very badly before her husband finally shows up to take her home again. And as she's walking out this time, she goes, oh, my God, oh, my God, it's time to go home. And then she hugs Christine and she leaves. And it's, it's absolutely devastating. Mm -hmm. Like, even though she's gone through what she's gone through, she still treats Christine like a human being which Christine isn't doing to her and she like gives her this hug and like tries to make a connection with her which is what she's desperate for and she doesn't have and it's I don't know I, I just I just thought it was an, a, an amazing performance an amazing scene great yeah. writing like all around yeah 100% and I think like you said that hug is just sim symbolic of her craving touch and like kinship and it's one of those it's like I don't know how to explain it. It's almost like, you know, she doesn't like Christine. She doesn't respect Christine as a human, but she respects that she's a mother doing the best she can. And she knows there's something up with her and just that's enough. It's like, I don't know. It's something beyond frenemies. I don't really quite have the words for it, but I, I love when you see that on film, right? It's like, you, you know, like you have been through this similar kind of experience. You're like, okay, I don't have to like you, but I can like, I can, I guess begrudgingly respect you on that one note, but like, otherwise like don't ever speak to me again. <laughs> it's like that in there. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. it will be like more, like you said earlier, like a mutual respect for motherhood, you know? Yeah. I think, I think that's what it is. Yeah. So the, um, after Hortense leaves, Christine starts to call Colonel Penmark, but um, despairs of having anything constructive to tell him. So Monica returns and reveals that she allowed Rhoda to go out and buy another popsicle which kind of confuses Christine because she's like, oh, she normally doesn't isn't doesn't have like a sweet tooth like that or anything. Or she's watching her figure like a mature little girl. <laughs> she was. So then Rhoda then comes back into the apartment, crosses to the music room and starts again to play her favorite tune, Eau Claire de la Lune, on the piano over and over, slowly at first and then faster and faster until she's playing it, break, playing it at breakneck speed as the scene progresses. Mm -hmm. While she's playing, Christine hears a man's voice from below screaming at the top of his voice for someone to let him out. She then hears a desperate knocking from inside the sloping cellar door and then sees a cloud of smoke emanating from that cellar. Monica's brother Emery and Mr. Tasker, who is still staying in the house, try desperately to break the cellar door open, but before they can get in, the screams rise to a blood-curdling crescendo and then stop. Um, they, they finally break it free, but we don't see, like, obviously it's 56. We don't see a lot of this, yeah, but I think this is so suspenseful that the, like, I think it works perfectly fine that we don't see any of this. How, how do you yeah. feel? Yeah. Similar. I feel like it's like the Jaws effect, right? Where everyone's just like, oh, it, it was so brilliant that like we only saw a little bits of the shark, but it's like, well, in reality, it was production reasons. Like the shark malfunction. That's why I didn't see it, but it's more haunting that way. And I think in this one, it's like scary enough that a child is a killer that I don't need to see the bodies to be like freaked out. The fact that she knew how to time, how to set that fire and how to lock it and get out of the room quickly and be poised and is playing the piano um, is like freaky enough for me. And especially like the, just the eeriness of like the screams increasing as the piano increases. It's like you said, it's blood curdling. It's like, this is so unnatural um, and it's really effective. And you you mentioned orphan earlier. Does she also play the piano? She does, yeah. she does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I'm like, I'm like, oh, another callback I didn't catch. <laughs> I love it more. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't I've only seen Orphan within the last like three months because uh, okay. when Orphan Two came out, I was like, I kinda wanna see that. So I saw the original. I was so have you seen part two? Yes. Yeah. Part two's I think it's better than the first one. It's so camp. It's so fun. <laughs> it's so like the turn. I, w I won't mention anything because I want people to be, I mean, there was a turn in the first one. So, you know, there's going to be a turn in the second one, but like yeah. that turn is so amazing. And like that's up right. until that point, I was like, okay, I mean, this is fine. This is fine, but whatever. But then that, and I'm like, oh fuck, it's so great. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I've never been around for when or I haven't 
because I didn't watch like a, a newer movies very much, I haven't been around for like the beginning of like a cult classic, but yeah. I think that is going to be a definite cult classic. There's no way it can't be. It's just so amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. So the owner of that voice was none other than Leroy, who was burned to death and because someone put a lock on that door and he wasn't able to escape mm-hmm. someone. <laughs> so then Christine now suffers basically a nervous breakdown and starts to strike the dining room table with her right hand and babble about it being too late and, and her being blind and finally screams at Rhoda to stop playing that piano tune over and over. When Rhoda does come out of the room, Monica has to restrain Christine from striking Rhoda. Christine then collapses in tears as she confronts the realization that Rhoda has killed yet another person. But Christine blames herself, not Rhoda. Again, adults making excuses. Mm -hmm. And because Christine is now fully convinced that Rhoda inherited the murderous tendencies from Christine herself. This is where I wanted to mention again, that teacher who died when Christine was younger. Mm. Did something happen there? Um, So I know that you had mentioned about nature versus nurture. And I have a very basic understanding of that. Are you able to talk to that and kind of explain what it is and what you think about it in this movie? Yeah, I think um, so. It was really big. So the funny thing about Freud is like, it's not necessarily a, a Freudian concept, but Freud, obviously 20s and stuff is like when his stuff was coming out, but it wasn't actually popular in like the pop culture way of the time until like the 40s, 50s. So it makes perfect sense. Everyone's spouting Freudian. Now a lot of that stuff is debunked, but Freudian nonsense. Um, But Freud's big deal was that he believed that like every issue you had could be traced back to your mother or father, your parental figure or guardian. And that like, if you didn't parent in the right way, you were like dooming your child. Um, And then like the contrary argument to that was like, (sighs) <sighs> the more uh let's just call it what it is like systemically racist argument and like classist argument that it's like oh no people in certain environments and then the movie refers to as quote unquote the slums um movies words not minds that if you grow up uh, with like less money less access to education uh, frankly, non-white parents thinking that that is what causes criminality. It obviously, it comes up again. Reaganism era bullshit. Uh, but that's it's not true. It is true that like people that have like less access to money or things like healthcare have more financial struggles. Probably more like mental health that is going untreated issues. But there's not a direct connect between like your your fortune your race and like how psychologically like well balanced you are uh but for a long time that was like like a deeply held belief that's why people thought that like uh if you were born into the right family that you will have success and that's why um a lot of like waspy people believe that they're better than other people because it's 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 tying into that same just like horrible eugenics thing where like you can like program a bad gene out of someone if you are bred in the right way and you come from the right surroundings but like now you know that's not true like what you need is like stable emotional support systems and that like some people have brain chemistries that are different and yeah there's something you said about like if mental illness runs in your family that yeah if like say you have a parent that you know has depression and anxiety is there a chance that you might be born with that totally but there's also just like situations in life that can not make that happen just by like your lived experience there's sometimes situations that can bring that up um a big one that is like comes up all the time is like schizophrenia because it always is used as like a plot device in horror movies too and the really the really uh hard thing to talk about with schizophrenia is that like you could have like the schizophrenic gene and it normally doesn't come up until like your 20s like around 25 is when it will start to show uh or it can never be activated at all and like you'll never have any experiences with that but like you have that like illness in your family so there's a chance you might have it um but yeah i think this film is really just like not, not that complex about that's not that nuanced. It's focusing more on like the how could this happen to someone like Rhoda who comes from this rich white family with all the resources available and like at the same time I think it's questioning like did they do a good job parenting Rhoda or not and is Rhoda just destined to like 
not be okay. And the truth is like, you can be someone that is like sociopathic and live a normal, stable, happy life. You just have to have mental health care support and people around you like helping you realize the difference between how you see the world and how the world works. Um, like you said, if it goes unchecked, like uh, you can bring down whole countries. If someone always just reinforces that what you're doing is right because where you come from is right because who you are is always right, you're mm-hmm. never going to have to question that like you might be doing something wrong. Um, so yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> no, I, I love that. I appreciate that because I, I could not speak to it the, the way you did. So thank you so much. Yeah. For, for giving us that aspect or that information. Yeah. <laughs> so later at night, Christine is reading Rhoda again. And this scene caught me off guard, like uh, uh, definitely caught me off guard. Um, she stops and reminds her that she has new vitamins to take. Mm-hmm. And Rhoda asks to see the vitamins first, which I thought was like this little girl, like she doesn't trust anybody. She doesn't even trust her mom, but she, we find out that she uh, switched the the pill bottles, right? Yeah. Uh, so Christine lets her read the pill bottle and then she hands it back to her mom. And then Rhoda confesses to killing Leroy. Uh, she says that she set the Excelsior on fire and locked him in, all the while insisting that the fault was not hers, but Leroy's because Leroy shouldn't have scared her with his loose talk about police investigations, evidence, and little blue and pink electric chairs for children. Christine reveals at this point that she has dropped Claude Daigle's medal onto the pilings at the pier where he drowned. Finally, Christine gives Rhoda what she says are the new vitamins, but they're actually sleeping pills Mm -hmm. in an amount that is obviously an overdose. Christine then continues to read to Rhoda as Rhoda fades off into sleep. Christine says, Rhoda, you were mine and I carried you and I can't let them take you uh, or hurt you and, and I can't let them take you away. Only I can save you. Sleep well and dream well, my only child and the one I love. I shall sleep too. And after putting Rhoda to bed, Christine goes to her room and shoots herself with Colonel Penmark, sorry, with Colonel Penmark's revolver that they said they kept in the apartment earlier. Absolutely heartbreaking scene, and the score here is absolutely excellent. What did you think of this scene? Oh, it's so good. Uh, it got me questioning a lot about how. So, very to like the death aspect of it, like Rhoda doesn't have at this point. Rhoda doesn't have to keep confessing things to her mother, and I kept asking myself, like, why is she? Does she actually care for her mother in the any as much as she could? Is it because she's strategic and she realizes she's still a child? So she needs a parent figure to like house her and like give her money and give her things because she can't quite do that on her own or does, doesn't want to. Cause like, why did, why does she need to if she has a rich, rich mom? But um, I just thought it was fascinating that like, I don't know the answer to that. And Rhoda wouldn't tell us any, like anyway. <laughs> um, and then I think like, there's something like you said about the overdose amount, like, the excuse that Christine gives her is like, Oh, don't worry. I have to take these two. I have to take a lot too. Uh, I still, I'm still just like, it makes me think that she must feel some sort of way towards her mother. Um, Do you think that she sees, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. no, I was gonna say like maybe some sort of trust because I wonder maybe that's why she keeps confessing to be like, I'll tell you this, what are you going to do about it? And so far she hasn't done anything. So I wonder if it's just like her testing the boundaries to be like, does she actually care about me? And I, um, accept that even if I don't necessarily feel like deep love towards her. Yeah. That, that kind of goes along with what I was going to say is, do you think that now that the truth is out there between the two of them, that perhaps um, Rhoda sees a kindred spirit in her mom, somebody who understands her? Yeah. I think it's like the closest Rhoda has gotten so far to like having a friendship because she's not concealing stuff. She's sharing things. Um And so I think for her, this is maybe, I wouldn't say love, but maybe a kind of friendship. Um, And that is just a new concept for her. Like, I don't think she totally understands it, but I think she's like trying it out. Um, It's just fascinating to watch. Uh, And it makes it heartbreaking because you you start asking these questions and you're like, 
well, your mom is killing you, dude. <laughs> like, um, an emergency killer, right? Again, like uh, it brings it back actually to like what you're saying about um, uh, is has this mother Christine ever entertained the oh. idea of murder before? Because like, wasn't her mother the angel of death? Like, yeah, she just give a mercy kill. Like, how do we know? Um, because it was like we were saying earlier, it's such a drastic. I. Well, I we weren't in the situation, but it seems it's just such a drastic um, way to deal with a situation. Like another situation, another way to deal with it is to take your daughter and leave and go somewhere else. Like and change, change your name, yeah, or yeah. try to get your daughter help because obviously she's not going to be put in prison or they're not going to get yeah. killed or anything like that. Yeah, she's but too this was her she's not <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> and this was her first reaction was to kill her daughter. Well. Where do those thoughts come from? Or are those hereditary as well? And is yeah. it because it was easy for her to do this because she already did it previously? You know, I don't know. I, I love the part that it, not everything is spoon fed to you, which mm-hmm. I absolutely love when a movie does that, where it still gives you room. I mean, we've been talking about this movie for over two hours and we're still yeah. like <laughs> finding things about it, you know? So, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I love that, that aspect of the movie, but well, did you think that we were going to get to this point that, that she would, she was going to kill her daughter and then kill herself? I, I thought she was gonna, I thought two things would happen. I thought either that Rhoda would have killed Christine and then, like, the dad would come home and be like, Daddy, well, this horrible thing happened. Um, mm. Then it would be, like, a great way to, like, get the attention. Um, or I thought that Christine might kill Rhoda and then get, like, locked away or something. Um, but this is, I guess I'm viewing it from more of a modern perspective. Uh, but still, at this point, I did not expect what happens next with Christine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so it, that first scenario that you're talking about reminded me of, like, The Omen. If, you, mm. if you've seen the omen like that, yeah, yeah. that's ending. So yeah, this definitely inspired the omen. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> Two days later, Mr. Bravo and Colonel Penmark both return from their prospective cities, discuss the apparent attempt at murder suicide. So first we find out that Christine did not die. Mm-hmm. And she is actually under the care of a, of a doctor and there's been some surgeries and, but she's in a coma now and they don't know if she's going to recover or not. But Monica's in the room as well, and she's basically telling uh, Colonel Penmark that he has to be strong because he has something to live for, mm-hmm. um, someone to care for. And then we hear somebody humming in the hallways, and then we see Rhoda walk in the room, and she's like tap dancing or and stuff. And we're like, oh, wow, it's a surprise. She actually survived. Yep. Uh, this caught me by surprise, and you were saying it caught you by surprise as well? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, I'll wait till we get to the end end. And then I'll tell you, like, if you don't already know it, the way that it, it originally ended and then how the, the Hayes Code once again messed with that ending. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Rhoda asks if her mom, if her mommy is better yet. And uh, her, her dad says uh, sh- sh- he doesn't know. So he hugs her and says that she has the same smile as Christine. Then Colonel Penmark takes Rhoda home. Uh, before the, the doctor comes out and say says we, we're not sure yet, you know we need some time. So Colonel Penmark takes Rhoda home, but her father Richard Bravo asks the hospital doctor whether Christine had mumbled anything while he was attending to her. The doctor remembers that she kept repeating the phrase "bad seed" over and over. Mister Bravo says that Christine was about to write a book about inherited criminality, but the doctor, as Mister Bravo had done totally rejects the theory saying that no one would dare to adopt children if that were the case. Mm -hmm. So this is what you're saying. Very responsible way for them to put that in there. Yeah. And so Colonel Penmark puts Rhoda to bed and Rhoda asks what made her sick the night mommy hurt herself. Um, And the the Colonel says he's, he's not sure, but they're going to find out. Uh, Then they do the basket of kisses bullshit. (laughs) Um, Rhoda says, Monica says that when, when Monica dies, she's going to give her, her lovebirds. And the Colonel says, that's nice, but Monica isn't going to die for a very long time. So then she asks, well, how long do birds live? And he says, well, he doesn't know. Uh, She says, that's okay. She's, uh, but he does say she, I'm sorry. She asks if they live longer than humans. Mm -hmm. And he says, no. So then the wheels are turning, like you mentioned earlier. And she says, she'll ask Monica Monica tomorrow when they go sunbathing on the roof. So it's like, okay, we're setting that up there. (laughs) 
so he takes a call from the hospital as Christine desperately wants to confess that she has, quote unquote, sinned a great sin. The colonel says that whatever the problem is, they will face it together. Mm. Rhoda, meanwhile, has put on her raincoat and, and has gone out of the house. She walks all the way to the Fern School grounds and onto the wharf where Claude died. Rhonda wants to retrieve the metal. And so using a flashlight, she sp- it looks like she spots the metal underwater and takes an old metal fishing net to try to snag it. And we didn't mention that it's it's thundering and storming out right now. So she grabs the fishing net, trying to get the metal, effectively turning herself into a lightning rod. And uh, lightning strikes her and knocks her into the water, killing her instantly. Mm-hmm. And the pier fucking explodes by the grace of God. <laughs> And it's so funny. The um, they put a, a a body double in there, or not a body double, a fake. What do we call them? Uh, like a dummy. Dummy, probably. like a dummy. Yeah, like a dummy. And it's just kind of like propped up against a wheelbarrow because people never thought in 1956 that they we'd be watching this in high definition 70 <laughs> years later. You know, so you can obviously tell that. Uh, but yeah, so she is killed uh, immediately. And so what did you think about that? I, I know we can get to the yeah, alternate, and stuff. alternate and, and all that sort of stuff, but but, spe- but specifically about this ending, what did you think? I will say, I mean, once I learned about why it was changed and then kind of sort of changed my read about my first wash of it, I will say that I loved it in the sense that like, I didn't expect them to kill a kid on screen and Hell just show yeah. it. And I was okay, like, kids. holy cow, you just set this girl on fire. Like, and the idea that like only, like no one could stop her. Her parents couldn't stop her. Society couldn't stop her. Like a divine force of lightning had to kill Rhoda or she would have just lived on forever killing people. And I also love, again, I'm bringing up orphan and orphan first kill again, but Esther's walk, you know how she walks in that like, like studded way where it's just like tick, 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 tick. That a hundred percent had to come from the bad seed. Cause if you watch Rhoda when she's walking with her little flashlight against the fence, it's like that same kind of like purposeful strut that's just so sinister, but also so delightful. <laughs> like I can't put can't put my finger on it. Like it's almost it's like almost campy with like how determined she's walking with her little flashlight. Um, but it's so good. Yeah. I love the two because I'm all for doing the ending that's best for the movie. Yeah. And not so much appeasing uh, the audience, yeah. with one exception to that, which was Get Out. Again, I'll bring Get yeah. Out again. Um, and spoiler again for Get Out, I'll give me about a minute. But are you are you aware of the two endings? Yeah, so, yeah. That uh, because because of like what was happening in 2016. I want to say. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, Peel changed it to be a bit more optimistic because they're like he's like I just can't do that. That's that's not fair. But there's an extended. There is an alternate ending that I think is on like the DVD of it, so you can see it. Exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, but I think like he, I, I think in that way, that might have been too much of a downer for 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 that particular movie. Yeah. I but guess so. but like, I hate like the and I've talked to my wife about this a lot because she she's not big in horror, she's bigger into horror movies now, but like she likes romantic comedies and yeah. and uh, you know, just re- other other types of movies, and and a lot of those movies, they'll just tack on an ending, and the ending will mm-hmm. be. And everybody got married. Yeah. You know, so that sort of thing. It's like, well, that's not necessary. Like you can have the sad ending. You can have the, you know. So I like that they did that, that here. It was just, it was just so great. And it's, I, I think it was like very brave of them to do so. And then, and then they kind of killed it towards the end, you know, or after this, cause they kind of, they couldn't have it just end there. They needed to do something else. But yeah. so, so the movie ends, except where we get this casting call sequence, which, uh, the actors playing the various parts introduce themselves or their names are on the bottom there. Christine appears next to last. And then she, she says, Oh, you, and she walks off screen. And then we see them on the couch and she jokingly grabs Rhoda and pretends to spank her. And then the last frame is a a title card or a picture words on the screen. And it's a plea to the audience not to reveal the quote unquote, unusual climax mm-hmm. and then that's the ending and i don't know about you but this felt like a um a, a cop-out for me yeah. um it's just like we had this very serious moment and then this comedic stuff and it's kind of like there was a movie i saw recently where it was a very serious horror movie and then the credits were were like bloopers of the of the audience members and we just went through this really really 
like tense moment. And then you have these bloopers at the end. And it's like, what are, what are we doing here? You, you've been working two hours to try to get me into this, uh, you know, into this feeling, into this mood. And then you just kill it with these things. So I, I don't know. What, what did you feel? First of all, uh, sorry. Yes. What did you feel about this? Uh, well, I can get into like why things are changed and how it changed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So in the original, in the book and in the, in the stage play, the way that the bad seed ends is Christine gives rid of the sleeping pills. Christine kills herself with a gun. The only reason I mentioned the gun is because it's the sound of the gun that alerts the neighbors to come find Rhoda. So inadvertently, she saves Rhoda's life by how she chooses to end hers, uh, which is very dark. Uh, yeah. And so Rhoda lives. Rhoda lives on. Christine doesn't survive. Uh, that was not okay with the PCA who runs the Hayes Code of the Era. They're like, we can't do that. And the main reason why was because they were obsessed with the idea that if Rhoda survived and wasn't punished, it'd be inspiring kids again nurture argument <laughs> inspiring kids to go out and commit murders or to like not see her as the villain they were afraid that because she was so on the surface likable and cute that we that they wouldn't younger audiences wouldn't understand that she's bad and what she did is bad which i think is like really insulting to kids like i think kids are pretty aware if they're watching this like murder isn't good and like everyone is sad around them like you have to kind of trust that younger audiences aren't that that impressionable so what they ended up doing is they, uh, the director changed it so that two two big things changed. Um, Christine somehow survives, although the way it's impossible, but they just like, she survives. And they also uh, made sure that she had a phone call with her husband to ask for his forgiveness for the sin she committed. Because also oh my God. Um, part of the, because yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise, uh, the same people that are in the Catholic Legion of Decency also had their hands in the PCA. So like we need to, to also make sure that she atones, right? So that's why that phone call is so strange. Like when I watched, it, I was like, oh, he just really loves her. But when you take a step back, like your wife just tried to kill your child and herself. Like I wouldn't necessarily say I would jump if I was in that situation, I wouldn't jump to like blame or like hatred or anything. But I think I would, I wouldn't be as like saccharine as he is in that moment. So that explains right. why that was changed. And then they also, because they were still so afraid, so silly that like people wouldn't understand that Rhoda is bad. They ended the film with that like curtain call sequence and that whole spanking scene. So they can really like drive home the fact that like Rhoda was punished. Rhoda wasn't good. Rhoda couldn't survive and Rhoda needed to, um, be like humiliated in a way. Uh, so that was all because of the Hayes code. That wasn't all supposed to be in there. It was supposed to end like it did in the in the play. Um, I am interested in the idea of like Christine surviving and Rhoda dying. And I think that's just still shocking and interesting. Uh, but knowing how it originally ended, I'm like, oh, hmm, do I want Rhoda to survive? I don't know. It's it's fun either way imagining it. <laughs> Yeah, um, I very rarely want a little kid to die, right. <laughs> like, and also like Rhoda was like your atypical little girl. Well, I guess she um, presented as your typical little quote unquote good little girl or, or whatever. Yeah. But inside, she was yearning to be something different, and mm -hmm. like she was anti-establishment, which is I always love to see. It's kind of like punk rock, but also. Yeah. You're killing little you're killing little kids and stuff like that, you know. It it would be like uh have you seen uh Sleepaway Camp? Yes, 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 yes. So like again, spoiler for if you haven't seen Sleepaway Camp, but um you know, Angela in that movie kills a bunch of people mm -hmm. and she's a little girl, but everybody that she kills is like pedos and bad people, you know. So like yeah. you're like you 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 know that she's killing somebody, she's killing people, but also, you're like, yeah, we can. I can root for her. I, I don't. It's not the same thing here. Like you, you like Claude. All he did was have really bad penmanship and then have yeah. good penmanship. You know, he just tried and then you killed him for that. Cursive, and then he yeah. had to die for. It. Yeah, that's fucked. So, yeah, um, it, it's kind of a little confusing how I feel about about yeah. her as a as our antiheroes or not even antihero. I don't know. The, yeah. But yeah, so that was the bad seed from 1956. What'd you think about it? I really enjoyed it. Uh, I definitely am going to want to rewatch it again. And I think this is actually one of those films where 
I want to watch it uh, with my husband who hasn't seen it yet just to like be watching similar to like Orphan First Kill just be watching for like the reaction shots because I don't think I think when you first this movie you imagine it's going to end I would probably say like in the the like the last time she reads a story it's a Rhoda you're like okay this is where it ends is that's pretty dark oof but you didn't expect it to just keep going. Um, so I would love to see someone's reaction to that. Yeah, like there's a perfect, there's a cut this film where they just end it with the gunshot. Yeah. How dark would that be, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought it was going to happen. I was like, holy shit, what did I just watch? And then it kept going and I was like, what? <laughs> because if you think about it, like the extra scenes, Rhoda still dies. Like, so she could have died with the pills. Yeah, but I guess the, like you're saying, they couldn't have the mother kill the, the daughter, but the daughter did night to die, so God needed to kill her. Yeah, the morality sort of thing. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, okay, I think yeah. one fun fact to add. I think yes, it's, it's <laughs> in, in keeping with the theme of the show, uh, the Catholic Legion of Decency, which I still get a kick out of that name. That their whole job was to like basically uh, condemn or not condemn and rate films during like the 30s until like 1980, wildly enough. Uh, they actually were okay with this film. They gave it a rating of A-2, which just means adults only, but they had no problem with the excessive amount of drinking or the murder. Um, so of all the films they condemned, they did not condemn the bad seat because God killed Rhoda. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> as, as long as our guy wins, right? <laughs> Oh, that's I hilarious. That. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Um, but so yeah, from like everything we've said so far, like the the acting, the directing, like um, you know, I, I don't know like the cinematography in it. I, I I didn't there weren't any like real shots that were like, oh wow, that's a beautiful mm-hmm. shot. I think it was pretty like straightforwardly directed. I, I don't know where was there anything in particular, like any shots that caught you like as particularly beautiful or um, I would say scenic. I think the end I think the shot we talked about with the door shutting in the hallway scene I think that was very haunting but I think oh, for me yeah. like I think that that was good I think that one really stuck, sticks out with me but I think it's mostly the sound design that I think soars in this movie um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna I forgot I looked it up and I forgot his name right now but I think it's still on my phone um, yeah, Alex North did the sound design for this movie, uh, and he did like everything from Spartacus to like a streetcar named Desire to Cleopatra to like modern things like um, do, 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 do. let's see, no, that's all I'm coming up. I take that back. <laughs> um, I think he did the sound. I did a soundtrack recently for some film that came out, and I was like, are you kidding me? Oh, he was involved with like the soundtrack for Euphoria for Fire Island. Like, like this guy is still making incredible like music cues uh oh that's cool is that wild (laughs) yeah that's crazy so um i guess let's just go into ratings i mean we've been just just talking about this movie um how much we love it so what we do is we rate movies um out of five upside down crosses Mm -hmm. so how many crosses uh, upside down crosses would you give um the bad seed from 1956 and granted I, i understand like uh, ratings change from day to day. You may feel one way about a movie one time and change it another time. You may even want to up your rating that you give today based on having watched it a second time or right. vice versa. So just how you're feeling right now, what would you, how many upside down crosses would you give the bad scene? I would give it four upside down crosses. I think mm-hmm. Rhoda earns at least that. <laughs> she never got her medal. So... <laughs> yeah, for all that. Well, I guess she, she had the medal, but she couldn't keep it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Four upside down crosses. That's a pretty, that's, uh, would you consider yourself a hard, um, rater? Like, do you rate movies pretty hard or, or or are you liberal Um, with your ratings? I feel like I'm pretty even keel. I feel like more, more often than not, I like consider a lot of stuff middling. Uh, but if it really like excites me, then I feel like I usually rate it pretty high, but, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I I think I'm going to agree with you. I think I'm at, I'm at four upside down crosses. You know what? No, I think I'm going to go four and a half. I think I'm going to go four and a half upside down crosses. I was struggling with that too. <laughs> yeah, because I was I was actually coming in at four upside down crosses um, before we started talking, but as we were talking, like just finding out like all the little tidbits that they've sprinkled throughout the movie, mm. um, it, it's just it, just like talking with you about it has given me more of an appreciation for this film. The, mm. 
it's not a perfect film. Like it does have its, uh, it does have its issues. One of which being some of the direction of the actors. Like I said, it does hurt it and, and help it in, in some point. Um, and then the length as well, like it was two hours and nine minutes. Like there was from when she finds out that she, or she's possibly like, uh, from when Christine finds out that Rhoda is possibly killing people or whatever to like, when shit starts hitting the fan and all that stuff, there's like an hour and like 15 minutes just right mm-hmm. there. And it's just so much, I'm not going to say filler because I enjoyed it, but two hours and nine minutes is, is a ridiculous amount of time for this movie. I think it could have yeah. been condensed and been a bit more powerful. Yeah. Um, I, I think so the, the start could have been like, you could have cut out some of that starting bit and like, just like condense some of the conversations in the middle. So I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to give it four and a half upside down crosses. So, all right. All right. So now in order for you to be fully absolved of your horror movie sin, I, I will be uh, suggesting three movies for you to watch and you um, can either watch these movies or not. That's up to you. If you don't watch them, you might burn in the fiery pits of hell. That's not <laughs> up to me. That's up to you. But in a very rare first time in any episode of this show, I already have the three movies that I want to suggest to you (laughs) because, (laughs) because during our conversation, they just came up um, naturally. So the first one I would suggest to you is whatever happened to baby Jane from 1962. And that's uh, starring Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. Um, Absolutely amazing film. I just did it. I think it might have been the last episode that I released or second to last episode. That's so funny because Betty Davis was almost going to be Christine in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw that. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. Uh, But I think you're absolutely going to love this one. And it tells a story about a, I won't give you too much away, but it tells a story about a former childhood uh, star and what what that kind of does to you when you're in like a showbiz family mm. and then when you grow older and start and stuff starts to fade which is funny because um the actress who plays christine in this movie was a childhood star and then patty mccormick who plays rhoda she was a childhood star and she's still acting as of this day so it's just amazing so uh, the first one like i said would be whatever happened to baby jane my second one that we talked about is night of the hunter from 1955 this is starring Robert Mitchum and Shelley Winters. It's another black and white film. It's, and I've done an episode on this one as well. It's absolutely amazing. One of my favorite films ever. Um, I think it has that same kind of black and white. I mean, that same kind of style and it deals with, with kids in danger, that sort of thing. So I think, I think you're really going to like that one. And then the last one I'm going to throw out here in an effort to not be the old curmudgeon who's always recommending black and white films from the 50s and 60s. I'm going to, um, I'm going to modernize them a little bit and I'm going to say The Good Son. Have you ever seen The Good Son? No. From 1993 starring Macaulay Culkin? No. Yeah. He had a heart. Yeah. Huh. Um, so he plays like a boy who's like showing increasing signs of violence and psychopath psychopathic behavior uh which is what we see here from rhoda and so yeah i think those three movies whatever happened to baby jane the night of the hunter and the good son i think you're really really gonna like those movies awesome thank you miguel i'm so excited no problem well Cass, thank you so much for joining me this has been an absolute blast i had so much fun and i really appreciate you coming on would you please let everybody know where they can follow you, how they could support you. Yeah, so uh, for now, until it burns down into the fiery pits of Musk Hell, I'm on Twitter at Cass underscore underscore Clark. You can also Google Cass Clark. Uh, my website is CassandraAshClark.com. It has all my work there and contact info. I also have a monthly, sometimes bi-monthly, if I'm feeling energetic, horror podcast called Horror Hangover. Uh, definitely you know, like, subscribe, give us a listen. We have some fun episodes coming up on vampires, uh, the terrifying ones and the funny ones. And I co-host with Ryan C. Bradley, uh, who's a fantastic host and author of Saint's Blood. That is a novella that's great if you really like creepy things like exorcisms and a little bit of torture, but not too much. Nice. Yeah, and I've actually been uh, a guest on the show Horror Hangover. We talked about 
non exploitation. It was just a lot of fun. You, so you and Ryan are are just uh, great people to talk and to talk with and talk horror movies with. And it's been fun uh, to be able to to do that with you guys. So, thank you so much for agreeing to come on once again. I hope you you'll watch those movies or, or you, you don't even have to watch those, movies, but you'll come on later on and we'll talk about another great movie. Oh, I would love to. It's been a blast. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to follow me, you can follow me again on the hell hole that is Twitter <laughs> at MHC pod, like my horror confessional uh, pod. You can follow me on Instagram at my horror confessional. Um, you can follow, if you'd like to email me, you can email the show at my horror confessional gmail.com. We do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash my horror confessional. We just finished up our first six months on Patreon. And for those of you who don't know, the first six months, we donated all of our pledges from the Patreon to women's organizations that were fighting the fight to grant um, uh, access to women, including abortion, because abortion is healthcare. So we ended up raising almost $700 over the six months to various charities. And that was a lot of fun. And thank you to my um, subscribers for allowing me to do that. But that's the show. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll talk to you guys next time. Mm-hmm.